Welcome to our Zoom audience and our in-person audience. I'm just queuing the Zoom people so they know we're getting started and we will start our program in just about a minute. Thank you for your patience and thanks for being here. Good morning, everyone. I hope you can hear me okay. Welcome to the Montgomery County Commission on Aging's public forum on smart homes, smarter care, technology to help older adults age in place. And thank you for joining us today in person and on Zoom. I'm David Engel, and I am the chair of the Montgomery County Commission on Aging. Our event today will focus on how we can better help our older adults age in place with grace in a safe and secure home. The Commission on Aging developed this public forum to create awareness of this important topic, to highlight insights into the type of technology available and present useful advocacy and forward-thinking ideas our community can implement to make this life better for our older adult residents. I would like to thank our county and state leaders who are here to, with us today. We have Sydney Katz, council member. We have Mayor Judd Ashman, who I'll introduce in a second. Mayor of Gaithersburg. We have Neil Harris, uh, council member, city of Gaithersburg, and Ryan Spiegel. City uh, of Gaithersburg uh, Council Member. So thank you for joining us today. Uh, the commission is partnering with the city of Gaithersburg today. So it is especially fitting that I introduce the mayor of Gaithersburg to say a few words, Judd Ashman. Thank you all very much. Um, it is a pleasure to be with you and a pleasure for the city to um, host this event. Um, I want to acknowledge my colleague, Ryan Spiegel, the longest serving city council member we have in the city of Gaithersburg. Um, great, great to be here. We're, we're just here to provide a very brief welcome. Uh, and I want to I want to thank all the participants, our panelists, uh, our sponsors, our attendees. Uh, I think it's it's a really important thing that we do each year, um, supporting the health and wellness of such uh, an important segment of our community. And I, uh, I love the, the theme of aging in place. Um, it's, it's a subject that's uh, near and dear to our hearts and, and uh, has, it has garnered a lot of discussion at the dais at, at the um, city council uh, chamber. Um, so I hope it's, uh, a wonderful, fulfilling event, and also because it is May, um, I, I have to, uh, I've been in front of many of you already this morning with the bookmarks for the same the date for uh, the Gaithersburg Book Festival, which is coming up in two weeks, and it is free to attend and free, free to park, and we're bringing in some of the best authors, writers, journalists on the planet to come uh, talk about their latest work and sign books and workshops and what have you. But I'm not here to, to steal the thunder of the Active Aging Expo. Um, I will quietly hand out um, bookmarks uh, over <laughs> the Expo Hall. And, and on behalf of our city council, our staff and our residents, welcome and enjoy today.
I would now like to introduce the Chief of Montgomery County Aging and Disability Services, Dr. Odile Bernetta. Thank you so very much, David. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. All right, very good. And uh, thank you so much, Mayor Ashman, for welcoming us again uh, this time around. It was a wonderful event last year and terrific partnership between the Montgomery County Commission on Aging and, and the uh, City of Gettysburg. So thank you so much. So there is a lot of things going on in the month of May. And uh, our uh, mayor of the uh, City of Gettysburg told us about the special book fair. We also have across the country uh, celebration of all the Americans. And so um, back in 1973, 50 years ago, um, um, our elected officials in Capitol Hill, our Congress, men and women, established the Older Americans Act. And that um, legislation enabled us to obtain federal funds to deliver services across the nation to older adults and their family members and establish a network all across the country that is called the Area Agency on Aging Network. And here in Montgomery County, obviously we do have such a wonderful service. This is the group of people that you can contact when you have questions or when you know someone who has a need for services uh, in the area of older adults and persons with disabilities. So I will just make a little info commercial for that phone number, 240-777-3000. We'd love to hear from you if you have any questions or know somebody in need, we'd be very happy to help. And so I do have a special proclamation that I am presenting you on behalf of our Montgomery County Executive, Mr. Mark Elridge. It is quite lengthy. I'm going to read it, so uh, take your time. And I know I have a little accent, so uh, again, take your time. So, uh, whereas Montgomery County celebrates unbridled aging, and we acknowledge and honor the vastly diverse aging experiences in our community by ensuring diversity, equity, and inclusion in our programs and services that all the adults as their aging place. And whereas the Montgomery County is steadfast in mitigating the historic stereotypes associated with aging and recognizes the unique and varying degrees of needs among the older adults, and whereas Montgomery County is 60 years and older aging population make up at this time 21% of the county's total population with an expected continued growth to be up to 35% by the year 2040. And whereas Montgomery County is committed to guaranteeing our community remains ed friendly, where all other adults remain safe, connected, and free to age unrestricted. To showcase our commitment, this year, on October 26, 2023, the county executive will host a summit on aging, and we are all invited to do so. So please mark your calendar for October 26. And whereas Montgomery County promotes aging flexibility, because we all benefit where all the adults are included, engaged, and freely participate in their community boundlessly. And whereas Montgomery County is a better place when people of all ages, abilities, and backgrounds are acknowledged, celebrated, and provided a safe environment where they can remain connected to their community as a journey throughout their life cycle. And whereas Montgomery County is a culturally rich community committed to safety, independence, and respect for all of the adults as they age in place regardless of income, age, and ability, meeting all the adults where they are and ensuring community supports as they journey through life unbound, encouraging people of all ages to celebrate independence and taking the limits of aging. Now, therefore, do I, Mark Elridge, as County Executive of Montgomery County, Maryland, hereby proclaim May 2023 as Older Americans Month, signed by our County Executive, Mark Elridge. And now I'd like to introduce a special greetings from our county executive, Mark Elrich, and there is a video that's coming right along. Thank you.
Hello, everyone. I'm pleased to welcome you virtually, and I want to thank the Commission on Aging for developing this public forum tonight to highlight the challenges and present solutions for our older county residents to use technology to remain safe, more connected, and independent in their homes. The Montgomery County government has over 75 boards, commissions, and committees involved in all manners of affecting life in our county. Our Commission on Aging is one of the most important, serving as an advocate for the health, safety, and well-being of the county's older residents. The Commission on Aging identifies significant issues where its voice on the needs of older adults can make a difference. According to the 2020 Census, over 160,000 Montgomery County residents are over the age of 65. That number is projected to increase to nearly 250,000 residents by 2040. Our Commission on Aging is their advocate, their voice, and their champion. According to a University of Michigan poll on healthy aging, a large majority, 88% of adults between 50 and 80 years old, believe that it is important to remain in their homes for as long as possible. Montgomery County is increasing broadband access, supplying free laptops and tablets to county residents and providing extensive free technology training and support to older adults. One of my favorite programs is our Senior Plan and Montgomery Partnership with AARP. Senior Plan helps seniors learn new skills, save money, get in shape, and make new friends. These courses, programs, and activities are changing the lives of older adults. Our older residents are learning how to better connect and interact with their families, whether they live nearby or far away. By breaking down technical barriers, we're opening worlds of opportunity while combating loneliness and isolation. These efforts help to improve the health and safety of older residents, especially those who receive needed care. Through our policies, we can integrate smart homes, smarter care technologies into all of our county's programs and help our older adults stage in place. I hope you learn more today about these successful programs and that this information helps improve the lives of older residents in our county. Thank you again to the Commission on Aging for creating a public forum, highlighting technology issues, and bringing to light tools and resources to help our older community thrive. Thank you to the County Executive and thank you to Dr. Um, Brunetto. A few housekeeping notes before we get started for our live audience here and online. Uh, during the panel discussions, we will welcome questions from the live audience. And we do have a Zoom Q&A function activated. We will try to do our best to, to answer those questions. And if we don't get to the uh, Q&A on Zoom, we'll answer those after the event. Uh, there will be a lunch break and we encourage everyone to check out the Active Aging Expo and the expo tables and come back here for an awesome afternoon session. This continues on after the lunch break. For those in, uh, in person, there's some water bottles in the back. And uh, so please stay hydrated. It seems that we got the weather back today. And please use the back exits if you need to use the restrooms, they're in the main hallway. And now it's my great pleasure to introduce Steve Gurney, who will be leading us through this morning's session. Steve is the founder of Positive Aging Community and the publisher of Pod Positive Aging Sourcebook, which we have copies in the back. In 2020, when all our lives were rocked by the pandemic, Positive Aging Sourcebook responded by creating a series of online gatherings for professionals, older adults, and families. Steve has created an incredible library of these active discussions. These discussions are live, interactive, and incredibly relevant and informative, and they continue on today. We are fortunate to have him here today to help us learn more about how smart homes can help lead to smarter care as we age in place. Everyone, please welcome Steve Gurney. All right. Well, thank you. That was, uh, th I'm real excited about today. And as David was talking about these online discussions that we do, which you can learn more about at proaging.com. I'm not really an expert at, in anything. I just talk to a lot of experts and I glean that information. 
And that's one of the things that all of us are going to be doing today in this room and, and online is we're this Montgomery County Commission on Aging has put together a lineup of presenters that is really going to help all of us think outside of the box and understand resources. And we really want to make this interactive. But um, the first part of our program, uh, uh, Montgomery County Commission on Aging has secured an amazing keynote speaker. And uh, we're going to have our keynote and then that will be followed by a panel presentation. So without further ado, let's get this program started. And I am delighted to uh, welcome Scott Code, who's the Vice President of the Center of Aging Services Technologies, which is uh, part of Leading Age, which is a national nonprofit. And Centers for Aging Services Technology is often referred to as TASC, but it's really, thought of as the national hub on aging services technology. So I'm delighted that we've got Scott today as our keynote speaker, and let's give him a big round of applause. Thank you, Steve, and thanks for the commission for having me today. Before I get started, I wanna just tell you a little bit more about the organization I work for and a little bit more about myself. Of course, the clicker's not working right now. That's part of technology. Yeah, a tech guy. Can, okay, so Leading Age is a nonprofit association of aging service providers that span the whole care continuum, from home and community-based programs such as home care, nursing homes, or home care, um, senior centers, and NORC programs to more congregate settings such as a nursing home or assisted living. We have membership throughout the whole US, but you can see from the map, map, we have a lot of members in the Northeast. And we also, I work for Leading Age National, and we have 43 state affiliates. So you might be familiar with Leading Age Maryland or Leading Age um, DC or Leading Age Virginia. Within Leading Age, as Steve mentioned, I work for the Center for Aging Service Technologies. And think of us as technology evangelists. Is it a hard time hearing me? Okay. I'm going to hold it because I think I'm a little bit too tall for this. <laughs> so I, uh, so CAST, I, we're technology evangelists where we're trying to get people that work with older adults in senior living communities or in the community themselves excited, but also be very thoughtful in the, the types of technology that, that they're using and, and adopting. Um, I've been with Leading Age for about nine years. My last name is Code, C-O-D-E. I am not a software engineer. I do not how I do not know how to write one line of code. My background is actually in gerontology and business, but I've spent the last 20 years working in this age tech space, whether that's in the community or with, with um, leading age. And I'm excited today to kind of go through some of these kind of smart home technologies that can really help older adults kind of thrive where they want to be. So why is this important now? Why are smart home technology? One of the main drivers in my mind is just the, the sheer demographics of the United States and how everything is changing. By 2034, it's projected that for the first time in the US, there'll be more older adults than children. And you notice here on the right, the, you know, the population pyramid we're used to, it's kind of shifting to a pillar or a column where there's a you know, symmetrical proportion of older adults um, throughout the lifespan. And also, so the perceptions are shifting. You know, older adults are preferring to remain in where they're at in their home. You can look at the survey from ARP, 77% of people said, what I'd like to really do is remain in my community for as long as possible. And 76 said, what I really like to do is remain in my current resident for as long as possible. So you got a large shift of older adults and also the preferences, I wanna age in place. And then if you look at the senior living industry overall, even before COVID, some of these congregate nursing homes were, were closing and that's actually sped up a little bit because of the pressures of, of COVID. So you see a, a little bit of a disinvestment in some of these congregate settings, but there has been a heavy investment in more community-based programs that support older adults in their community. And also you have this huge 
shift in terms of all these tech enabled services that are now available 10 years ago you couldn't get an uber or someone bringing you food from whatever app you want so there's services like instacart which will bring you groceries from your favorite local grocery store or organizations like papa where you can request a friendly visitor to visit you or task rabbit has anyone used task rabbit before okay what did you use it for groceries fixing a light bulb moving okay so these are these are apps that allow you to carpentry yes exactly so you could i mean and it's helpful right that you can get these tech enabled services so you can stay home um lowe's has been getting into this business in terms of offering products and services that help you age in place and support your community and then just the general influx almost every technology is considered smart whether or not you want the smart feature it it is like there's smart tvs um smart locks security systems, lighting control systems, bathrooms, garage doors, appliances, um, whatever, whatever you, you know, almost everything in your, in your home now can, can be considered smart. But today I wanna focus on three main categories of smart home technology that I think is probably most relevant. And those categories are safety, health and wellness, and then social connectedness technology. So the first one I wanna talk about is safety technology. How many are familiar with the, the pendant, the life alert system where you press a button, there's a receiver, and then the operator says, hello, are you okay? Um, how many people you think that have these actually wear those systems? Not a lot, unfortunately. So when I worked in affordable housing buildings, I'd visit residents and I would see they have the receiver on their on their desk and I wouldn't know, I'd notice they don't have their pendant. It's like, well, what happens if you need help? And like, well, then I will go over to my nightstand, pull out my drawer and get the pendant. I'm like, no, it doesn't work that way. Um, but some people do wear them. It's, it's a valuable system. The system has evolved a little bit. So some of the, the, pers the technical term, some people use as personal emergency response system or PERS, but the technology evolved but where it has more features than just pressing the button. Some allow you to, um, they have fall detection using accelerometer where if you fall, it can predict that you might've fallen because of the speed that you go to the, to, to the um, floor. Also, a lot of smart watches have some of this tape capability built into it, like an, a newer Apple watch can be enabled to help detect whether or not you've fallen or even actually been in a car crash. Um, you can see there's a smart speaker there as well. If you don't want to wear anything, you can enable smart speakers to ask for help if you need it. And if you don't want to wear anything, you don't want to say anything, there are passive sensors that use motion. You see in the bottom right hand corner. It looks like a sensor you kind of find in a normal home security system, but you can have those systems set up where it measures your activities of daily living, whether or not there's any motion outside your bedroom. That usually can indicate something wrong. Or you go in the bathroom and no, no motion outside for four hours. There's something potentially wrong. Um, and also on the bottom right or left, there are systems that if you're taking care of someone that is at risk for a, wandering elopement there are tracking types of systems where you can have smart souls or smart watches that a predefined perimeter can be identified and if that person approaches or, or goes past that they can be um, notified even most smartphones now have like find friends how many are using find friends to track a relative or friend i use it with my wife because instead of asking me where i'm at all the time she just looks at my phone and says okay you're on the highway right now and you're three hours away so if you don't if you're not using find friends and you have I, I encourage you to do that just because it, it allows you to know where people are at okay so health and wellness technology also you know some of you are probably using devices to help manage whatever illness you might have or just your overall wellness like a blood pressure uh, a scale but some companies are using that da data and they're having it electronically submitted to a healthcare professional to help monitor whatever condition you're having, um, which can be very helpful. And you can see here, it, it comes with a screen as well. And that screen can be very helpful in terms of providing educational content that's relevant to something that you, that you might be um, dealing with. When I worked for a community-based program, affordable housing, we had a telehealth kiosk and we had these peripheral devices like a scale blood pressure pulse ox but we also had a digital screen where it, it would provide educational content that's relevant to something that they're dealing with, like diabetes, and they'll tell them like, these are the things you should eat when you're taking your medication and so forth. And since it has a screen, 
You can also do tele televisits. How many are, are, are comfortable doing telehealth visits with their physician? How many were comfortable with it before the pandemic? A couple, yes. So these can be very helpful. If you don't wanna go see your primary care physician, you can do a telehealth tele, um, visit. And these systems can be set up to do that as well. And there's a lot of technologies out there also to help with medication adherence to make sure that you're taking your medication when you need it. It could be a smartwatch with reminders. It could be a smart pill box that's connected that will um, ding you if you need to take it or these more kind of uh, controlled devices where you press a button, a capsule comes down and the right dosage is already in the, in the container itself. And if you don't take it, someone will call you to make sure you're okay. And lastly, I want to talk about social connectedness and engagement technologies. And out of the three types, to me, this is probably the most important, especially if you're, if you're considering just staying at home. If you go to a congregate setting like a um, retirement community uh, or lifeline community, you're more likely to be around people just because of proximity and the programming. But if you're staying in the community, sometimes your friends move away to a more a retirement community or or something happens and they have to move out of their community and you're more at risk to be a little bit socially isolated. But there are a lot of technologies that help support you if you wanna stay in your home in terms of helping you stay connected to family, friends, and actually making new, family, making new friendships. Um, such as on the upper right-hand corner, like a smart digital display, like an Amazon Echo Show. Some of these devices can be configured to um, allow you to have someone drop in and have a video chat where you don't have to, you don't have to do anything to initiate conversations. Conversation. It's more of an appliance. But with that, you know, there's kind of privacy concerns. Like, do you want your your son to be dropping in on you whenever you want on the screen? Um, also, I want to mention on the bottom right hand corner, you can see this is a captioned telephone. Having hearing loss can be very isolating. If someone's calling you and you don't understand what they're saying, you know what the default answer is? No because I don't know what I'm saying yes to. But if I can read what the person's asking me, I'm more likely to engage in activities. So caption telephones, it's not high-tech technology, but it's an important technology. I don't know if you, everyone realizes this, but when you pay your, your phone bill, there's a relay tax that you pay. And that rate, relay tax pays for this caption service. So this is a free service that anyone can, doesn't matter how much money you have, just as long as you have some type of hearing impairment, you qualify for this. So if you know someone that you call and every time you call, there's a hard time understanding what they're saying, suggest that they get a caption telephone. Companies like Hamilton, Hamilton CapTel provide this service free and they charge the government for that, the relay tax. And I know there's, there's organizations in the expo hall that not only provide some of the safety technology that I talked about and the health and wellness, but also a reference or resources for hearing assistive technology. Not all technology has to be high tech. Assistive technology can just be as, as impactful as some of these smarter tech um, technologies. And, it, and I, uh, I, I encourage you, each state has their age tech center. I encourage you to reach out to their assistive technology center to look at those technologies as well. And in the bottom left-hand corner, in 2010, I, I worked on a really awesome project called the self help Vir Virtual Senior Center, where I helped connect um, homebound older adults in New York City together in group kind of congregate virtual chat sessions. You know, that was over a decade ago when one, no one was doing this. But now, how many, you know, how many virtual programming can you go to in a day? It's like mind boggling how much content is out there and opportunities for people that are at home. Like right now, there's people at home listening to me talk because they're not able to come here. So that, that's one of the you know, one of the good things that came out of the pandemic is there's been the shift of all these, all this technology and all these other opportunities to engage if you wanted to stay home. You know, I've talked a lot about technology and how, you know, it can help you. And is there any research to support this? This, this kind of literature review um, looks at the technolo technological interventions for community dwelling older adults. And to see, like, does it really help with social isolation and connectedness? And out of the 26 interventions that they looked at, the majority of them did find a, a significant correlation between the, their level of um, isolation um, and the technology intervention. So it's, I'm not just making this stuff up. There are actual use cases where this stuff is, is working. Um, but, you know, when it wasn't working, it was usually because the technology was too complicated 
or um, the individuals had pretty low digital literacy and adoption was, was low. Well, I want to talk a little bit about technology adoption because a lot of time, the thing I hate is when someone buys a PERS device, whatever type of device, and they don't use it, they put it in a drawer, they have an iPhone, they don't use it. A lot of tech people like to talk about features. Okay, the camera has 56 megapixels, it's this processor speed, but what people really want to hear is like, how is it relevant to you? How is it, how is it going to in increase my overall quality of life? And that you know, marketers need to be better at making sure these technologies, they're, they're aware of them and make sure that they communicate relevant value that's meaningful to you. And I think they can do a better job of that. And also, I think there's an opportunity to provide ongoing training and support. You can't just dump a technology in someone's home and expect them to use it if, if there's no one to call, if there's a problem or any type of training. And you have to be transparent about any concerns there might be. If it, it's a voice assistant technology, you know, be transparent. Like some of the information might be recorded. There's a way to, 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 um, to delete it. And also identify influencers and early adopters. I used to do a lot of presentations to, to senior living communities about you know, passive censoring, monitoring, telehealth. And I realized quickly that there, no one really wanted to listen to this kid talk about tech. And I, I realized I knew residents that were using tech and they could be my advocates. So I, I would I'd do an introduction. I would have an, a resident come up that's using a technology and they would speak to, to, to the group saying, hey, this is how it's changed my life. This is how I'm able to sleep at night knowing that if something happens, I know someone will help me. So if, you're, if you are using a technology and it's really having an impactful you know, on your quality of life, I encourage you to use that to help influence your peers to adopting technology because at this stage in our life, there's so much usefulness in some of this technology. I encourage you to kind of sp spread that knowledge. And lastly, not everyone has access to digital technology. So digital inclusion is still a huge issue. It doesn't matter about your, your age, but you have to have these three things. You have to have access to affordable broadband, access to affordable devices, and then digital literacy, some type of training and support. As you heard earlier today, there are programs, um, there are programs for digital literacy through the Senior Planet Montgomery County, which is amazing that you have, not everyone has this. Like Senior Planet is not everywhere, but it's in your county, which if, if you want digital literacy training, I would, I would tap that. Internet connectivity, broadband, there are programs, the affordable connectivity program right now, if you're low income, it provides a $50 subsidy to your monthly internet cost and a $100 discount off a hardware device. Um, so, you know, those are some things you need, need to consider. And, you know, I talked a lot about technology and a lot of different categories, but to me, you know, where to start, I would start with, okay, make sure you have the basic infrastructure in your home. If you want to stay at home in terms of having a robust Wi-Fi network. And then the next step, what I would encourage you to do is like, what, what's, you know, what am I concerned about the most? Am I concerned about safety? It might be getting a smart doorbell so I know if someone comes to the door, I know who it is. Or if I'm concerned about being socially isolated, I might want to engage more in video chat applications to help me make, make new friends and enhance the relationships I, I have. Or if it's if your health and wellness, you might want to get, and engage in kind of a telehealth um, platform as well. So I encourage you to, to you know, think about how are you using technology and um, use your, your peers as reference. And I have a few minutes for questions because I know that was a lot. Does anyone have any burning questions um, about smart home technology? I'm here, hello, hello. Okay, um, so any questions and I'll uh, run around, give you the mic if you want to, uh, this, this, was, this was great, Scott. Um, any, anyone brave enough to be the first question to ask? There we go. Um, uh, we recently moved from New Jersey. We were first looking at uh, senior housing, um, uh, not ha senior housing, but um, uh, retirement communities. So in Maryland areas, we were surprised not to find too many. Is there? Is there was there a reason why certain zoning don't don't allow these kind of like in New Jersey and Florida there's so many senior retirement communities. 
Yeah, it, it depends on the location, but it varies. I can give you my card and I can, their leading age Maryland can reach out to you and, and tell you all the different members in, in your community, but it, it varies. And the definition of what senior living, um, your definition might be a little different than what my definition is in terms of it might have affordable, affordable or market rate housing, but with no services. And I don't know if you're looking for services or not, because it depends on the type of community that you're thinking about. Great. Um, we got another question here. Uh, I think it was Tuesday, the Surgeon General put out an advisory that suggested that uh, social isolation is uh, probably up there with uh, uh, smoking and obesity yes, as one of is. the major public health threats. And I, I applauded that because uh, it really makes a difference. But he made the point that um, Technology is both a boon and a bane uh, because a, a lot of what's driving the social isolation, particularly for people who've been feeling outcast to begin with and have been isolated for a while, is the go-to on the, on the uh, internet or uh, community on the internet, but it takes away from the direct contact that's so necessary to help with your physical and mental health. Do you foresee how virtual can, can embellish in person? Yeah, I mean, there, you know, there, you, you can get stuck in, you know, being on YouTube videos and doing things that are more isolating, but you need to focus on activities that actually make, make, make you feel a little more socially connected. It's best to go do in person things, but that's not always realistic for people. And it's all in moderation. So um, if you're able to get out and be in the community, do it. If you're not, try to use technology, but not technology that's going to make you feel more isolated, right? If you're focusing on Instagram or something where you're looking at all your friends and they're going on vacation and you're stuck at home, that's not going to make you feel good. But if you're able to have social interactions with your friends or make friends or play games, that might be more engaging than, than that kind of activity. So you're right, you know, technology can drive that feeling, but it also can have negative effects. And I, I'm, I'm seeing that actually more prominent in younger populations where they're feeling, you know, my kids are young and I'm scared how they're going to feel about growing up in this social media environment and how it's changing so fast. All right. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, Scott, uh, we've got a robust online audience today and, uh, they're hitting us with questions. So we're going to, uh, jump in between these that's, live that's in great. person but one of the uh one of the online attendees would love it if you could please repeat the name of the social connectedness tool i think it was one of your previous slides you were talking about um social connectedness i know we were talking about senior planet which is absolutely amazing um and a, and a great thing i talked a little bit about the self help virtual senior center but i don't think that was what um, they're referring to. There are a lot of platforms out there in terms of Senior Planet too. If you want to engage not in di just digital literacy, you can do group group chat. It could be yoga classes. It could be other educational classes as well. And, and I did uh, mention the Hamilton Captel phone caption phone. Um, there are others, but that's one that I'm pretty familiar with. So if you're hard of hearing and you want to have that caption service, I would reach out to them. Since they're, con you know, kind of a lot of their money comes from the federal government. They have a lot of limitations on terms of how they market it. So they can't market aggressively because they don't, they're worried about fraud, but it, you know, when something's free, people are skeptical of something being free, but it actually is a free service and you should take, take advantage of it. Yeah. And here in Maryland, it's Maryland relay. So just look up Maryland relay. They're probably in the other room and you can get that one more online. And then we'll do a few more, um, uh, live questions. Uh, the question says, please suggest additional ways that children can encourage parents to take advantage of communication that could um, enrich the contact with their children and grandparents. Uh, and I think it's great that we've got the slide up for that. Uh, yeah, I mean, on both ends, if you figure out an activity that both the, the, the younger child and the older adult would enjoy, it could be reading a book playing a shared game. There's a lot of applications out there now that allow you to do something. You know, when I have my, my, my kids talk to my grandparents, sometimes they, there needs to be an activity to drive that conversation or they're just kind of looking at each other. 
So there's, there's way more platforms out there that allow you to have a more enriching, um, impactful and, um, engagement through that technology. Great. Here, we got a live question here. Hi, I'm Donna Mason, and I'm uh, with the North Bethesda Village. And my question is, at what age, you talked about early adopters. Yes. And um, my experience is at a certain point, it's really hard to get people at an age point. It's hard to get people to change their patterns. So do you suggest we look at an age uh, cohort as we look at adopting these technologies versus all seniors? I would look at the, the need. So when I worked at um, for the virtual senior center, there was people that were 64 that were homebound and there were people that 108 that were homebound that never used the technology before, but that didn't mean that they couldn't learn how to use it. Um, and the way that we framed it was, it was more of an appliance where it was an easy to use screen where all you'd have to do is touch touch a couple buttons to engage in a class so i i would i wouldn't put a limit on age bracket i would i would focus on the in their community what's the biggest need if safety is a huge concern or social isolation and then drill down on those people the people that actually need to hear what i'm talking about today are not here or they're not on zoom unfortunately and that's where you need to be your own advocate in your community and say hey I know you're socially isolated. I know you have zero technology and I know you're low income. You should apply for the affordable connectivity program. You should get a captioned telephone potentially if you're hard of hearing, you should start using some of these new devices and start slow and be, be an advocate and a resource for them. Um, you have a lot of resources in Montgomery County compared to other places that, I've, that I visit. And you're very fortunate and I'm glad that they, they exist. Oh, <laughs> this is great. We, you know, the online, uh, uh, audience can really provide feedback. They wanted to know what that that thing, uh, what the tech is in the top left. Top left, that's called LEQ. It's kind of a robotic engagement platform. The head swivels around and it's supposed to kind of talk to you and it will prompt you questions and you can do video chat with it too. Um, out of COVID, there's been a lot of funding to help with social connectors engagement. This LEQ companion device has been um, provided to a lot of communities for free as, as a pilot. So it's not only are you doing video chat, but it has a little bit of robotic AI application to it as well. And it has a proactive voice assistant where it can ask you how you're doing without ever, without saying anything. Oh, oh, okay. I have I been I'm told that we need to wrap this up and transition to our panel, but don't worry. We're going to be around at the break so you can do one-on-one -on -one questioning and we're going to get more questions that are going to address some of the topics that Scott was talking about with the panel. So for panel members can uh, jump up here on the stage and last but not least Scott, um, one of our, our online audience uh, wanted to know contact information for you. Uh, what's the best way for us to get in touch with you? Um, probably my email which is S-C-O-D-E at leadingage.org, S-Code at leadingage.org. All right. And I have cards, at, so. It's S-Code at leadingage.org. And for the live folks, he's got some cards that he can yep. uh, share with you. Yep. Okay, well, thanks Thank so you. much, Scott. Okay, all right. So now, Gonna trans we are going to transition into the panel presentation here, and uh, that that was really good, wasn't it? Great overview for a keynote to kick it off, and now we're going to dive deeper, and you're going to learn about additional resources. And I encourage you, let's keep this interactivity going uh, throughout. But what I'm going to do first is uh, introduce the panel members to the best of my ability. Mm -hmm. And I've got to pull out some technology here that we call reading glasses and um, make sure that I do my best not to botch anybody's name or their title. So uh, starting here closest to me, we have Steve Yule, who is the executive director of the Consumer Technology Association Foundation. Next to Steve, we've got Rima Oh boy, Juled, we have Rima, and she's going to tell you what her last name is, okay? But who is the Director of Enterprise Strategic Relationships with AARP? 
And next to Rima, we've got Ryan Elza, who's the Vice President of Innovation, Growth, Business Transformation with Volunteers of America. And at the end of the table, we have Neil Tantatinko, who's the founder and the CEO of Connected Home Living. And what we're going to do first is we're going to take a few rounds here. But our first round, we'll start with Steve, and uh, we'll have each of the panel members sort of tell you a little about themselves and what their role is in technology for older adults. And then we will have a conversation and we want you to jump in on this conversation. So I'll probably run around a little bit with a mic and if you want one of our panel members to elaborate or clarify or all the panel members to comment on something that you're interested in or concerned about, that would be great. So, Steve, let's kick it off with you. Absolutely. Well, I'm thrilled to be here, Steve. Thanks for the uh, introduction. Uh, as Steve shared, uh, I'm the executive director of the Consumer Technology Association Foundation. So, Consumer Technology Association is a trade association. They represent about 1,500 tech companies, everything from the big global brands you probably all know to actually 80% of their members are small businesses. 10 years ago, we started the Charitable Foundation as a way to give back on behalf of the industry. And we specifically decided to focus in on technology that can help both older adults and people with disabilities. So over the last 10 years, we've done a number of programs. In fact, the very first grant we ever gave was to uh, Scott and the Virtual uh, Senior Center. Uh, but we also fund a number of programs here in uh, Montgomery County, uh, Senior Planet, which has come up uh, several times, Access Hears, uh, and we work with a, a number of other uh, technology companies th that are working in this space. Uh, our association runs a, a big trade show that you may have seen uh, on TV, CES, uh, which is where all the technology world comes together in Las Vegas every January. And we're making uh, age tech uh, one of the big topics uh, there. So um, I'm thrilled to be here and looking forward to this conversation. Yeah, and uh, Steve, I mean, if any of you ever get the chance to go to Las Vegas to this consumer electronics show, you got to go, but it is really turned into this showcase for what we're talking about here today. Um, now, Rima, I apologize. I thought I had your last name nailed. That's quite Tell all right. what it is. <laughs> so hello, everyone. I'm Rima Jew at Google, and I am thrilled to be here. I'm actually pretty much a lifelong Montgomery County resident and have grown up in the area, actually realized I went to Summit Hall Elementary School for one year before moving closer into the Wooten School District. Um, so delighted to be here. My role at AARP is really looking at how do we thread the needle across the partnerships that we have, partnerships with CTA, partnerships with others, leading age and others. And how do we think about inclusivity in terms of access, universal design, the different products that you've just said, one of the questions in the back was very clear. We are working with companies like your Googles and your Microsofts to think about universal design in the products that develop so that, I think this just went out, no. So that all of us, no matter what age, can use the products to help us live and thrive. And so with that, I can pass the mic. That's awesome, all right. And uh, next is Ryan Elsa. Hi everyone, uh, pleasure to join you. I'm with Volunteers of America, so for, those of you who might not be familiar with Volunteers of America, we're a 127-year-old nonprofit that operates in 48 states in Puerto Rico. And so all across the country, our affiliates in uh, Volunteers of America, we operate hundreds of different types of health and human services programs. Um, and we are also the large, one of the largest nonprofit providers of affordable housing in the country. So we have about um, four, over 400 communities. That's around 20,000 units. And the largest proportion of our um, properties are affordable senior housing properties. And where I sit within the organization, Volunteers of America National Services, we uh, really focus on aging and aging services. So in addition to our affordable senior housing, we also operate assisted living, skilled nursing facilities, PACE programs, home health agencies. And my role is really to think about the types of enhanced services that we're providing the people that we serve and how technology can help support them and their ability to age in community. And so I'm really excited to be here. And prior to joining uh, Volunteers America, I'm actually an alum of ARP, where I worked for ARP Foundation, which is the charitable affiliate of ARP. And I led their um, social isolation work um, for about five years. And so social isolation and social connectedness 
are um, really important issues and close to my heart. So I really appreciate the earlier call out to the Surgeon General's report that he released earlier. It's equivalent to smoking 15 cigarettes a day. So just let that sink in. Yeah. All right, and our, our last panel member is Neil. And uh, Neil, tell us a little bit about yourself. So I'm Neil Tantico. I am the founder and CEO of Connected Home Living. Uh, and a little bit here, I'm gonna actually get up on the stage and I'm gonna dovetail with everything that Scott has just talked about. So we, we took, we're taking technology, blending it with live remote care coordination, and allowing seniors to age and heal at home longer. So. And, and what, how about we, we do this, since you've got some slides, Neil, yeah. if you want to give us a little bit of your presentation and feel free to take that mic actually, it, 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 yeah. And um, uh, this is gonna be an amazing panel and then we'll come back and we'll talk to the other panel members. A little bit of show and tell here, but it'll be really quick. So um, uh, I just flew in from California and uh, uh, been meeting with a lot of folks here in the East Coast. So um, there you go. Can you guys hear okay? Okay, fantastic. So yeah, so all we do is prevent rehospitalization, allowing uh, seniors to age and heal at home longer. And we do this by blending both technology and around the clock remote care coordination. So we use various forms of technology, but one form that we use is what we call remote patient monitoring. Uh, this, is, this is the technology we use to allow us uh, to reduce rehospitalization. Uh, every, every patient or client that comes out of our care, they receive a, what we call a, a telehealth kit, which you see here, it's, it's a tablet with its, with its own internet built in, uh, but it will also include a number of medical devices, such as a blood pressure monitor, pulse oximeter, weight scale. Uh, we even have a, um, a stethoscope and EKG, depending on the client's chronic condition. But when, when a client receives the telehealth kit, we customize it based on their chronic condition. And the whole purpose is to identify red flags before matters get worse. So when they step on a scale or they answer questions on the tablet, all that information is sent to our remote care coordinator. And if there's any red flags, we call them live on video. And we, we address this issues immediately by our clinicians. So instead of having to travel to, uh, to the ER, uh, those issues could be addressed right there and then. Here's a perfect example. So we have a client out of Missoula, Montana. Uh, she came under our care because she used to visit the ER two times per week, one to two, two, uh, one to two ER visits per week. She had multiple chronic conditions. She had a trait she didn't like to clean. She was morbidly obese, but also she was socially isolated. So under our care, we put her on our, uh, on our, um, our telehealth program. We start off with a phone call first because she was very adverse to technology. But as our remote care coordinators became, uh, started building their trust and helping her reduce weight, we actually encouraged her to install the app on her phone. And that's when we started seeing her live on video. And, uh, and the, the great part about it too is that we started pairing her up with volunteers who would uh, keep her uh, uh, a company. But the great part about the story is that after six months, instead of one or two ER visits per week, we only had one hospital visit, right? And that's how the uh, effect the program uh, was. So we, 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 what we also started is what we call the virtual caregiving program. This is, this is the solution's design to uh, complement private duty care services because not everyone can afford 24 hour care. And so to supplement that 24 hour care, uh, we added virtual caregiving as part of their care. So uh, it's very similar. We provide them with telehealth equipment, but we fill in the gap when there's no caregiver at the premises. So uh, like for instance, we have one client who only gets services Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. So in between the visits, uh, our remote care coordinators will call them live on video through their app or through their, through their phone or through the tablet that we issue, and we would call them and help bridge those, uh, those issues. But let me give you a real life example of how virtual caregiving works. So we have a client right here. She, she's memory impaired. Uh, she often forgets to take her medication, and she doesn't uh, eat at the right time. So oftentimes, she over and under medicates herself and often falls, results to a lot of ER visits. And so, uh, so with our remote care coordinators being paired to her, we would call her at seven o'clock at night uh, or the times when she's about to take her medication and we'd get on a live video call with her and make sure that she's taking the appropriate medication. And in the beginning, we would even go as far as watching her take the medication live on video, right? And so, uh, so about a month and a half later, uh, the fall started uh, 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 reducing and the, the ER visits started uh, going away as well. 
But the great part about this, this, uh, this picture right here is that one of the things that she misses the most is having lunches with her girlfriends. And so, so since she's uh, assigned to a remote care coordinator, uh, that remote care coordinator, her name is Maribel. Uh, she lives in Mesa, Arizona, while Sam lives in Utah. So every, uh, on, a, uh, on a regular basis, they would have a virtual lunch together, right? And so, uh, so that's a picture, that's an image of, of, uh, of a, a particular event. Now, um, so that's the, uh, the virtual caregiving program. And then what we noticed, though, is that once the, we, we started adding another layer of technology, uh, which we call file detect, I, I, I'm not sure if you've seen this one, Scott, but this one is a radar-based technology. It doesn't use a camera. It doesn't use a pull cord. There's no wearable. It just, it's, you just place it about five feet on the wall, and it sees about 13 feet in, in diameter. And, uh, and what it does, it, it sees your high profile. So it sees you standing, sitting on a chair, laying on a bed. But more importantly, if it sees you laying, he sees you laying on the on the ground below a three foot plane. After two minutes, they'll, they'll get an alert. Right, a remote care coordinator will call in. We'll first call the uh, the house to see if it's a false alert, and if there's no answer, then we follow the escalation protocol. Maybe we'll call the neighbor. Maybe we'll call the assisted living front desk. Uh, but the whole point is to try to get that help immediately. But if there's no help uh, that we can get a hold of, then we call nine one one. Right. So that's another form of technology we use today. And the last technology we use is uh, very similar to what Scott had mentioned, where we use uh, motion sensors, door sensors. And, uh, and what it does, uh, the system, it actually records the patterns and, and behavior of the resident living at home, especially when they're living by themselves. And over time, it actually creates a routine. And once you sway away from that routine, uh, it breaks, it sends an alert. So I'll give you an example. So we had one client who normally goes to the kitchen and makes breakfast and cooks uh, 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 makes coffee, then reads the newspaper, 7 a.m. regimen, right? But in this particular day, there was no movement in the kitchen, but yet we noticed they're still in bed and it's almost 12 noon. That triggered an alert, right? No fall occurred, but since the, they broke that routine, we contacted the resident, and sure enough, she uh, she took a, a a medication that was uh, that actually uh, caused her to vomit and and felt dizzy, and so we uh, contacted her, got the right folks uh, involved, and avoided that hospitalization from happening. So anyway, those are uh, I'm going to start from there. I'm sure we're going to have a lot more questions. So I'm going to. Uh, by the way, I have a booth up there too. If you want to see the technology live, you can see it there. Man, this is great, and I'm I'm just blown away at the panel that we have because to sort of have a panel member that it is implementing a lot of the technology that we're talking about today, it's a great uh, addition to the resources that we have here. But I want to I want to go to come back this way, and remember, folks, if you have questions, be thinking about them. I'm going to ask a few questions of our panel members. But then if you raise your hand, I can grab a mic and we can, uh, we can engage you in the conversation. But, but Ryan, uh, coming back this way, I'm really glad you're on the panel and uh, because affordability is truly one of the big issues that we deal with when we're talking about this technology. It's sort of like you go to the Apple store and you see how expensive one of these watches and it's like, hey, I want technology, but I might not be able to afford it in my budget. What are some resources and things that folks can think about in terms of affordability or that your organization provides? Yeah, I mean, that's a, a great question. So I think Scott already elevated one of those um, services or benefits that's available to folks who might be low income. So the Affordable Connectivity Program, which provides a $30 per month um, subsidy for uh, broadband services and a $100 um, device um, a subsidy as well is really great. So if you don't currently have access to internet within your home, um, you know, you can go online to Internet for All. Um, that is uh, a website that was developed by the White House that actually um, puts forward all of the different um, providers that are enrolled for the affordable connectivity program. So that's one area for at least within our um, affordable senior housing in our properties that um, are don't have internet connection. Um, we've been working with our residents to help enroll them in that program. 
Um, the other uh, types of resources I would encourage you to um, kind of look towards are your local area agency on aging. So oftentimes there are different types of, um, and it sounds like the Montgomery County has a really a lot of great benefits in terms of there could be potentially free devices um, that could have internet enabled um, data plans that go alongside um, those. And um, also your um, local um, assistive technology office. Um, so uh, Scott did a really great job of highlighting both high tech and low tech solutions. Um, so the assistive technology office can be a really uh, great resource in terms of getting to test a lot of different types of technology and understanding what types of um, low tech and high tech solutions might be available and oftentimes have lending libraries in which you can actually take that home and test it out in your home to see if it's a right fit for you before purchasing, purchasing it. Um, and also oftentimes offer um, some type of uh, like 0% financing if it's a more expensive type of technology that may um, cost hundreds of dollars. Um, so I would, uh, for folks who are looking for those resources, that's what I would encourage you to do. Um, what we do within our uh, communities is we really try to the best of our ability, provide free internet access and devices to residents as we're able to. Um, and then we also work with them um, to understand what benefits might be available to them through their Medicare Advantage plan um, or um, you know, their healthcare provider. Um, because oftentimes, you know, there are a lot of benefits that are available through your Medicare Advantage plan that you want to take um, uh, you know, use of in terms of there could be online um, fitness classes such as silver sneakers or other types of programs that you might be able to access in your home um, and some of those types of programs. Great. And um, uh, Rima, it, uh, it sounds like you do a lot of research and focus on family caregivers. What are some of the, uh, what are some of the, the challenges or barriers that people face in caring for loved ones at home? I'm going to start with first a poll of the audience. So how many people here, just by a show of hands, takes care of a member of their family in their home or even a neighbor? And how many of you call yourself a family caregiver? So I can actually hazard a guess that everybody here should raise their hands. Because at any point in our lives, we're a family caregiver, whether it's for someone younger, this is cutting out, <laughs> or for someone who's older and living in your home or remotely, remotely. And so the challenges that family caregivers face are exacerbated by lack of access and understanding, and even just the awareness that we should be calling ourselves a family caregiver. And a couple of numbers I'm going to throw out, and then I'll address the question of how do we look at this in the um, form we're having today as a way to address those challenges. In the United States alone, ARP knows there are nearly 50 million of us, 50 million family caregivers. And that figure represents unpaid family caregivers. And that's added to a $600 billion value. We call it valuing the invaluable. That's a report that you can access on, online. That is a $600 billion representation of people doing jobs that they weren't trained for, that maybe take them away from their jobs, their regular work, and that also contributes to the care and wellness of a loved one in their home. So access to technology and the challenge of accessing technology sometimes is mirrored by the fact that they're either in job loss situations, they aren't paid for the work that they're doing, they don't know how to access the other services that they could probably underwrite or support access to technology to help them do more in their home. And so these are just a few of the challenges that, that we know that family caregivers face. I, I, I love it. Thanks so much. And you, you know, one of the places where I thought you were going to go there when you asked the questions about raising the hand is I talked to so many people who I'll ask them the question, are you a family caregiver? And it's sort of like, they look at me kind of funny, you know, it's, we don't know what to call this category that, so that everybody understands what it means. Yeah. I think the thing that I hear the most, and even in my own household is it's just something you do. So I joke that we should be partnering with Nike and use that swish to say, just do it. Because, but the reality <laughs> is that, that most of us do it because that's just what we do. All right. Well, Steve, um, 
what are some of the challenges for smart home adoption and you know how do older adults deal with those barriers yeah absolutely so i think one of the biggest challenges is just awareness of what is out there. So, you know, all the products that Scott was able to share earlier, you know, a lot of people are just not aware of what's out there, what services and supports the things that Ryan was describing as far as getting accessible and affordable access to some of these products. And then the big piece is that that stool that Scott shared. Um, it is the training and awareness. We saw this during the pandemic. There were so many different organizations we were working with that were going out and providing internet access. They were providing uh, devices but then they left out the education piece of it. And what we found is a lot of those devices ended up kind of just sitting unused because you know, people appreciated getting it, but they, they didn't feel comfortable with it. Whereas providing some of those trainings with it, and whether it's with a senior planet or an oasis, or you know, there's a whole host of different organizations that are providing these uh, technology training classes, that makes a world of difference in being able to, um, you know, be able to uh, afford and use these types of products. And that brings the connection that is so, uh, you know, we've brought it up here numerous times, but just so critical that can come through uh, some of these devices. Yeah, and I just want to uh, build on that, Steve, because I, I earlier we kind of heard the question related to capabilities and age brackets, but um, Scott raised a really good perspective in terms of, taking a person-centered approach to technology and technology is not there for technology sake, right? Technology is solving problems in our everyday life. And it's really about understanding the individual that you're working with, um, you know, what are their capabilities, their desires, and really trying to then frame it in that perspective of how technology can enable to them to do things maybe they, they haven't been able to do um, due to, uh, you know, mobility or dexterity or having low vision. Um, so if the thing that is going to get you to pick up your tablet and use it is because you can actually um, FaceTime with your grandchild and see them and have that level of engagement, like find that pathway to figuring out what is the, the key that unlocks folks to having that first spark of joy in using technology and then really building from that place and how you can um, increase their self-efficacy and confidence in using technology, then you can see a whole world um, open up. And for us, we've implemented smart speakers in a lot of our properties. And really the number one thing that people wanted to use at first was like for music, right? And when we talk about technology, we also we often talk about it from like, well, how is it saving us um, money in terms of like the staffing perspective or the amount of care that's delivered or avoiding hospitalizations? Um, but really it is something that can transform lives and empower people. And if music is a thing that gives you joy and gives you pleasure and makes you feel happy and makes you feel connected, then that's a victory. And we should really be approaching it from like that perspective as we're thinking about um, implementing different types of Absolutely agree with that. And that's something I, I'm obviously a big believer in technology, uh, given the, the role I have with the Consumer Technology Association. But technology doesn't replace the people in the system. Technology is a tool. It can be used to help create those better connections, create the independence of being able to age in place at home. Um, but it's interesting to see the different types of technologies. So, you know, with all those different technologies that we saw earlier, the leading categories of smart home technology in American households right now are entertainment. Um, it is, you know, whenever we're talking aging, it tends to go to, let's talk about healthcare, let's talk about medication, let's talk about, you know, all of that. And those are critically important. But if you leave out the entertainment and recreation aspects of it, you're missing a big piece of life. So the, the leading categories for uh, smart home technology, it's smart speakers that we saw, you know, whether it is the, the leading ones are in the um, ones without screens, essentially audio only, but we're seeing a rapid adoption of the ones with screens uh, and actually think that they may surpass the uh, adoption uh, eventually uh, with smart uh, speakers. We're seeing multi-room audio, things like Sonos and others, where you're able to, to play music throughout your home, you know, streaming uh, devices to be able to uh, get different channels and other things on your, um, you know, 
smart TVs and things along, along those lines. Kind of the next tier down is more going into the safety and security. Some of the things that Neil was sharing, you know, things like video doorbells, things like security cameras and security systems, smart door locks, other uh, opportunities along those lines that can provide that peace of mind that comes with, uh, you know, being able to control your home and know what's going on throughout your environment. And then some of the biggest areas of growth that we're seeing is smart thermostats, uh, once again, controlling your environment, you know, smart uh, fire alarms and uh, CO detectors and other things along those lines. So we're seeing rapid adoption of these products. Um, in our survey last year, we found 70% of American households have some form of smart home in their uh, homes uh, and about 63% plan to buy more in the next uh, year. So uh, it's something that we're seeing a lot of growth in. But it's also about finding that value proposition that was what Ryan was saying. It's not about adopting technology purely for the sake of technology. It's finding what value is it going to bring to you to adopt that technology. Yeah, and uh, and Steve, I want to take a, a a little page out of your CES show and elaborate on what he's saying that really it clicked in with me. Is is that so? This Apple Watch that I've got. I use it primarily just to tell time, you know, and see what the weather is. But when I was at CES, there was somebody, this is years ago, talking about telemedicine. He said, how many of y'all have a physical every year? And everybody in the room raised their hand. It's like, how many of y'all ask your doctor, how's your hearing when you're trying to hear, hear my heartbeat in, out of the stethoscope? And he said, imagine the future where uh, when you come in and you talk to a doctor, that the doctor has looked at a year's worth of data of your health. And instead of talking, look, trying to hear your heartbeat for those five minutes, he's talking about what was going on with your pulse rate in April that, you know, was a stressful situation or what have you. And uh, really opened my eyes there at the CES show about that. But that's the thing is, is that you get a smart speaker for music, but now it can help you with your shopping and you can talk to your family members and things of that nature. So um, I really want to engage the audience both live and online with questions if possible, if any of you have those. So feel free to raise your hand, but while I do that, I'll, I'll, I'll get a question with you, but I'd love for the whole panel to just kind of, you know, what I learned at CES was the future of healthcare. What are some thoughts for all the panel members on what the future of healthcare looks like? And if I can grab one of those um, mics, I'll, I'll go over there. But if you all want to chat on that. I guess I'll go down the line again. Um, so I, I absolutely agree. Telehealth um, has been an incredible um, innovation for having people have more access to healthcare. We're working with an organization in DC called Mary Center that's working with people who don't have access to uh, telehealth, whether they don't have access to um, internet, whether they can't afford the devices or may not have a home uh, and finding systems that can actually bring uh, resources to those people and give them access to telehealth. Um, so we're looking at how we can reach that out to, to further communities uh, across the country. Um, I think you see a lot of conversation around AI um, in the news these days. I'm really interested in the machine learning aspect of that. And that's, this may be getting a little too technical, but it's essentially how these devices are learning what your preferences are. And it's going to enable your home to know what you want when you want it and start to be able to predict that. And it's going to give you better control over your overall environment. And that's gonna help you live the way you want at home longer. So that's one of the big areas I'm really excited about. Wow, there's so much, um, you know, ARP, we have many perspectives on what the future of health looks like in healthcare. But some of the things I recently heard, I was at a conference that was of all things, the National Association of chain drug stores. And what they're suggesting is that the future of health, apart from access and use of technology to help you live your life the best way possible, is that the pharmacy is now going to become the place where you go to visit when you have questions, not the doctor's office. What was interesting is of the top five professions across the US that are thought of as the most trustworthy, 
doctors ranked in there, and I come from family of doctors, but pharmacists ranked above that. And it's because of, through COVID, what pharmacy ended up doing. So I think um, kind of rounding the bend with the technology and the integration of technology, um, the different ways that you are going to be able to access healthcare is something else that we're seeing as part of the trends. Yeah, I would build on that and say that the, the delivery of healthcare is gonna be different and more and more of it's gonna take place inside your home because more people wanna age in their home. And so how is technology helping enable you to do that? So one of the ways that we're trying to think about the future of healthcare, given that we are a healthcare organization is the types of services that we're delivering. So we've been working to embed community health workers in our properties. And those community health workers are really working on that health coaching, health capacity building, and helping to equip our residents with technology and helping to educate them on how to use technology and how those supports can help them as a component of aging in community. And I think what we're also gonna find as we um, leverage AI and machine learning, you know, it's good, we're gonna move much more from this reactive place of medicine, especially as we move from a fee-for-service world into value-based in terms of how can we be more preventative and proactive and how can we use data and different information that's being collected, um, whether it's through wearables or other types of devices to really um, catch, uh, you know, uh, illnesses and chronic conditions earlier and really try to prevent those diseases and really think about how healthcare and technology can help aid in that process. And so that's really where I, I see the potential and future of um, technology impacting healthcare. Yeah, I, I echo everything everyone has said here in the panel. So we're living the world right now. I mean, that's what we do every day. So our remote care coordinators who are paired up with these, with our clients and, and, and patients, uh, it's, ex it's all the things you, you all talked about. Like we, we have a, when, when uh, a client comes to our care, uh, we, we line up their medication right in front of the tablet, we're making sure that what's on the discharge order is exactly what they have in the cupboard. Um, we have uh, volunteers uh, coming in and uh, they, they would, uh, we have one great volunteer here. Uh, every three o'clock, he would call Mr. Uh, Mr. Mayburn. Uh, he lives out in the desert. And uh, as he's walking through the streets of Palo Alto, uh, Mr. Mayburn could see everything that's happening <laughs> And it were uh, with this volunteers uh, experiencing. But anyway, um, uh, bridging uh, wellness, uh, uh, we're now also incorporating, uh, what do you call this, uh, mental health as part of our services, right? We're coming across with so many seniors out there that are, as you mentioned, lonely and isolated. And, and now we're able to bridge those services you know, at the comfort of their recliner. And uh, during a time when they want to see it, and so uh, it's really limited by our own imagination how we, where we can take uh, technology in helping seniors age at home longer. I love it. It's a real exciting future, folks. This is this is excellent. Well, we've got some online questions, but before we jump on those, let's uh, get a few from our studio audience here. I always wanted to say that. <laughs> Um, thank you. Thank you for your presentations. Um, you all are dealing with personal health information, and I wonder whether you can talk about the protections that are, I hope, embedded into your technologies. Great question on personal health information, uh, privacy, and things of those natures. Anybody who'd like care to comment on that? Well, I can start. So everyone who comes under our care, we, we have to, uh, there's a consent agreement we have to fill. Uh, they have to fill out, uh, authorizing our, our staff to have access to personal information. Uh, our, uh, everyone who works for our organization has to go through a HIPAA compliant uh, certification process. And so, uh, yeah, and anything, any advice that's needed, we, we always have to, uh, um, uh, what do you call this, uh, get authority for, for their conservator. So uh, all information are, are held uh, privately. Yeah, and I was just going to mention that um, as a part of our vendor selection, so if we're picking a technology or using a technology as a part of our services, we make sure that they have the appropriate sort of independent third party certification. And then our organization is actually undergoing high trust certification, which is like the platinum standard in terms of um, making sure that you have both the um, technical infrastructure that is for uh, protecting data and information, but also the policies, workflows, and procedures, 
and physical, physical security is in a building. Um, so we're undergoing that process because we take it very, very seriously. Um, Ryan, a que follow up question is, um, you had mentioned a certification. Does any, what are the independent certifiers for, um, for this? I guess HIPAA is one that we're all familiar with, but are there, what was the certification you had? Uh, so there's high trust, which is like the platinum standard. And I'm by no means like an expert in these areas, but um, there's also for technology vendors. So um, there's something called a SOC report um, that you can do um, SOC type two, type one that goes through different elements, but it's really to like technology platforms. Um, and then, you know, there are like fed tech standards um, for governmental agencies and um, other regulatory um, standards for other industries as well. Excellent. Okay, well, I've got a couple of online questions. And uh, this is going back to Scott, too. It's sort of where are where is there a list of technology specific companies and devices in the areas of security, health and connectedness is at the cast website? Is there a list of companies? Oh, oh, I'm sitting here holding the oh. microphone. So, sorry, sorry, on the leadingage.org um, website, there is resources for technology. It does have product information for consumers, but it's primarily focused on aging service providers. But there, there is a website called Tech Enhanced Life, and they have product reviews, and it's done by older adults. So that's a good resource as well. And some of the other panelists might have some ideas too. Okay, awesome. Well, uh, if there's any uh, podcast, Cast fans. Um, so Living Longer Better by Mary Furlong and also has had illustrious guests such as Steve Yule uh, from the CTA Foundation on it and is also sponsored by ARP is a really um, great podcast that I subscribe to um, and are, always has kind of some of the latest cutting edge um, information. Great. And yeah, Steve, yeah. I was going to say, don't hold it against Mary that she had me on her podcast. Um, but um, there are a couple other uh, resources, organizations, like there's a group called Senior Navigator. Uh, they focus primarily on services um, and they primarily focus on the state of Virginia, but a lot of it expands uh, to the greater uh, DC metro area. Uh, but they also do list a, a number of different technologies. Um, but one of the things I really see is a lot of these um, categories really focus on purely age tech uh, products. And one of the challenges is finding a lot of the devices are kind of the general consumer technologies and trying to figure out, you know, what are those products? And honestly, that is one of the biggest challenges. We've taken various cuts at trying to uh, address that. And I don't think I've seen every, anyone completely solve that issue yet. I was just going to add, and we've talk, talked about it a, a lot here, Senior Planet. It's part of the affiliate that AARP has with Older Adults Technology Services. CTA has partnered with us on it. Um, we have that here in Montgomery County, so they could be a great resource above, you know, anything else, just understanding how to use the technology that you may already have. Um, we also have the Age Tech Collaborative website. It's a place where you can go and see what we are doing at AARP to kind of build and foster that community of how people are starting to develop products, tools, resources in this space for universal application, but with the older adult in mind. One other resource I was just, sorry. Uh, <laughs> one other resource I was just thinking of, think about the installers and integrators that are in your community. These are people who you probably know them because they're best known for putting in like high-end home theater systems and other um, solutions along those lines. Many of them are focusing now on aging in place technology. And these people are geniuses when it comes to just hacking together different types of technologies that can specifically be, be designed to meet your needs. So they'll sit down with you, they'll figure out what it is that you're looking to do, and they'll come up with solutions that can uh, meet your needs. Only about 22% of people actually use these installers for smart home technologies, but they can be an incredible resource. Um, and many of them are, are very small local businesses in the area. 
I love it. Uh, great question from the online audience. The other question from the online audience, which I hope that we can facilitate um, online for those folks is contact information for all of the panel members. So hopefully we can drop that into chat for the online group or a recording at the end. But um, we've got, uh, Joan, did you have a question? Yeah, uh, Joan is one of our panel members this afternoon, correct? Um, I, I must say that I feel that I've met my people. I mean, you guys are fantastic. And I, I just feel like I'm nodding my head with everything that they say. I agree so much. And I'm local. I'm going to be talking this afternoon about the resources here. But one thing I'm really passionate about is how can we best, we know that education is huge and we have to empower seniors with the knowledge of the technology that's best for them as a person and have ongoing support for when they get stuck. I mean, to me, that's a whole key. And it's really, really hard to do. I'm a speech pathologist and assistive technology specialist and a specialist and a tech advisor. That's all I do is work with people to help them leverage the benefits of tech. But what do you think is the best way? I mean, we have to, in, in so many senior care communities, there's no one to go to for help. There may be some volunteers, but I'm, I'm sort of putting together an elder tech advisor group, which Steve and I have talked about for a long time of people like a train the trainer because there are a lot of volunteers, but they don't know about all the accessibility features and everything built into the devices that we already use. So I'd love to hear from you guys how you think we can help either online or really best in person where people are at support them. Yeah, no, I think that's a great question. And so I, I, where I've seen the most impact and um, I'm really excited to hear about your uh, looking into train the trainer and those types of models um, is building a little bit on what Scott actually mentioned in his talk in terms of, um, you know, how can you actually, for our communities, right? Like we are working with our residents and identifying those early adopters of technology and then really empowering them to be resident ambassadors of technology and peer supports in their communities because um, we all realize that there's there needs to be support for technology the uh, problem we deal with is like there's no funding to actually like put in technology support so we have to be creative and thinking about how we embed those types of resources and so one great way we um, have found success is identifying those residents giving them the training and the skills to be able to then help their peers. Um, and then the other thing that I mentioned a little bit before is we really kind of view the future of the community health worker role at the intersection of a digital navigator is one way for us to embed those supports within our communities. So one thing um, that has uh, happened recently is CMS um, released the updated rule changes for Medicare Advantage. Um, and so Medicare Advantage plans have to actually now screen for digital health literacy for their members and provide an intervention and solution. So I think we're going to start to see uh, more interest and drive in terms of like embedding more technology supports in communities and more creative ways to um, enable that. And I'm not sure if other folks have other things to kind of build on that. I just, I want to hold this up. Next door is um, a table for Senior Planet. You'll hear from them later this afternoon. Um, I just urge you, if you're interested in learning more, if you need to figure out for yourself or for someone that you care for, how to get them better access and understand the tools that they have from even the simplest things like apps, which some of us may find as simple, but for other people it can be daunting. So uh, that is another resource that you can leverage. Um, and then finally on the apps, I wanted to say that another thing AARP is working on, which isn't yet ready for full prime time, is how are those apps then rated for older adult use? So we're looking at, yes, digital health apps, absolutely great, fantastic, getting more and more in the kind of ubiquitous use, but how many of those apps are suitable for older adults to use and how do they leverage kind of the, the way in which they reach the, the older adults? So. Yeah. Oh yeah, I'll say, um, so nationally, uh, Senior Planet has a 1-800 number that you can call in. So if you need help for technology, they have that resource for you. And then there, there's other organizations like Cyber Seniors that also have a call-in number, but you can also schedule online appointments to have that one-on-one -on -one engagement 
um, to specifically answer your questions or work with you um, on technology. And then the other thing is um, look to intergenerational programming, right? So working with schools, whether that's high school, middle school, and um, really pairing um, you know, younger adults who are tech natives with older adults and kind of facilitating some of that engagement around using technology. Yeah, and, and that one could be just as easy as a kid that lives on your street is just, it's, this is a conversation thing. They can always say no, but it's sort of like, hey, could you help me with my phone? You, you know, somebody that, you know, helps connect the neighbors. We got another, oh, oh Steve, go ahead. Oh, I was going to endorse everything they said. One other resource would be there's an organization. Uh, it's actually based out of Easter Seals of Greater Houston, but it's called Bridging Apps. They have uh, reviewed hundreds of different apps um, and not just, I mean, they've mostly focused on the disability community, but they also have focused on age appropriateness. So you can go in to their system and look at, you know, what are the types of services you're looking for apps? And then also uh, filter based on you know age uh, appropriateness, so you're not getting you know something with a lot of cartoons unless you want something with a lot of cartoons. <laughs> I love it. Okay, we got another question here in the audience. Got a few hands going up, but let me start with this. First of all, thank you all for your time. Appreciate it very much, Mr. Elza. Uh, you said made a couple of comments that resonated with me. Uh, one, you mentioned AAA's area agencies on aging, I happen to be a AAA director in our state. So thank you for that as a resource. So my question to you, and, and you mentioned you know, limited funds and how uh, things are tight now. So my question to you is, as we look to enhance technology in my home county and a neighboring county in Maryland, um, what advice would you give a AAA director who is looking to you know, pursue these types of things when funds are tight. Thank you for mentioning the Affordable Connectivity Program. Certainly, I know there are grants out there, but if you could give some advice to a AAA director, I would appreciate it. Thank you. Well, so the, the biggest thing I would um, recommend everyone in this room, not just a AAA director, is um, when the infrastructure law was passed, the $42.5 billion that was allocated to uh, broadband and then also another like 2.5 billion educated to the Digital Equity Act. Um, and all of that money is flowing down to the state level and at that state level, it's then being allocated. So right now, every single state is going through this process of doing community listening sessions to understand how they're gonna spend that uh, funding and then how it will roll out to organizations. And so I would encourage you, if you haven't had the conversation with the Maryland State Broadband Office, who is responsible um, at the state level for that planning, to engage them into a conversation to say, how are older adults and seniors being prioritized as a population within the broadband equity dollars and the Digital Equity Act? Because the, the, the bead funding will go to actually um, infrastructure and like laying fiber to communities that might not actually have um, fiber currently running to them to have internet access. And then the Digital Equity Act um, will go to providing digital skills training, the actual purchasing of devices. Um, so you, uh, it's really important right now as the states are finalizing their plans to make sure that um, these populations are being prioritized um, and that in about next spring, that funding, um, well, the first round of funding at the state level will come out where in an RFP for organizations to be able to apply for it. Um, so definitely have that conversation is probably the number one thing I would say. All right. I don't want to take us down a rabbit hole, but this is a online question and then we'll get a, get another uh, live question. Do you see any potential application of the chat GPT to support aging in place and telehealth for older adults? And I would give you all a description of chat GPT, but I'd need to have chat GPT to give you that description. Maybe one of the panel members can first sort of do you, can anybody brave enough to sort of give folks an example that may not be aware of ChatGPT? And then if anybody has any ideas on how this could be implemented for older adults in the future. Sure, I'll, I'll take the first cut at this. Um, and this is where I say I am not an engineer. So um, ChatGPT, it's, it's a form of AI. Uh, it's a large language model. So essentially what they do is they train these models based off a lot of different content. And then based on that, the algorithm that it uses basically is able to predict that if you're asking a certain question, then 
it essentially says, you know, what is the most likely next word? And it forms sentences and answers based on that. So it's actually not technically answering the question. It's kind of giving you the answer that um, is most likely based on its training. So, um, you know, I don't know that that's the model I'd necessarily say for healthcare at this point, uh, but it is a very interesting model as they're getting smarter and smarter, uh, as they're getting more content in there. Um, I've played around with it and it's amazing when like, I'm just at the end of the day and can't think of the email I need to send. And I say, write me an email that, you know, goes to so-and-so uh, and, and says this sort of thing. And it's amazing what it'll come back to. Not necessarily something I would just hit send on yet, but um, so it's definitely something to be aware of. It's definitely something to, to pay attention to. Um, but I, I'm not saying this is something that we're all going to be uh, adopting, especially in the healthcare space at this point. Yeah, and I'll just say, so the, some of the newer versions that are currently being tested um, by industry experts and not uh, out and available to the public, I think they had um, Chad GBT take the board exam and it passed with like a 98%, right? Um, and then they were using Chat GBT in a couple examples to um, do like a one in a hundred year diagnosis um, of individuals. So I do think that the type of generative AI will enter into healthcare from a clinical decision support tool um, at first, and then in the future, who knows? But like, I, I, that's the immediate thing that I see coming down the pike. I was just scrolling through my email, not being rude, trying to find a deck because um, recently this was discussed at HIMSS, which is a conference for health, the healthcare industry at large. And at HIMSS, they had a whole panel on AI and its uses. But one of the interesting uses that I found, despite feeling that Skynet is active, is that doctors now can use the AI tool to dictate, you know how bad doctors handwriting, it's like a common thing, right? So. The AI tool can be helpful in at least that um, interim space where a doctor can now dictate and the AI tool can help and almost predict, but then be corrected as they um, dictate what you know they might have observed during a patient visit. So that was like from a very low place, but I think that's a, for me, feels more like a safer start of where AI can get involved. I love it. I love it. We got an audience question here. Um, actually, I'm going to quick plug, uh, Mitsuko Herrera, I'm on the afternoon panel, and we are presenting information um, specific to the question about the Senior Planet Helpline that's available. Also, the state of Maryland has launched a new Marylanders online call center for help. Um, the University of Maryland is also um, in the process of implementing some of the digital equity grants. So um, we have formed the Montgomery Connects digital equity coalition and part of what we are advocating for are some of these additional um, trainings and things around this and i'll have more to talk about this afternoon well, so stick around hey and they weren't planted in the audience here i'm going to go back here and then i'll come over there um let's see i i think i've got this question here then i'll come to you then i'll go over there this is more of a comment i just want to uh, recognize the value of villages when they support their members and uh, as they struggle with technology, especially around COVID. I don't know if you remember that thing. Uh, people were very um, concerned about keeping people connected. And if you're a part of a village, you have an, a ready-made infrastructure for support. And a lot of people received support from their village volunteers and staff to get them online and uh, connect to the apps that they needed to use to stay at home safely. So if you don't know what a village and how it can help you, find me later. You pick up a copy of Sourcebook in the back. There's a list of all the villages in the DC area. Okay, I have found this fascinating. Okay, and I am deaf. Talk to it. Okay, I am definitely at that age when I'm concerned about these issues. Um, but none of you have really addressed the cost of these things for seniors. Um, Low income people, I sometimes think, and I don't resent this, get more help than middle income people. Um, where does my insurance, and I am well insured, probably highly insured, but I bet it wouldn't cover Neil's services. Can you uh, comment, please? 
The answer is yes and no, uh, depending on who is uh, subscribed to our service. So hospitals today, uh, for every readmission that happens within a, uh, after, after your discharge from a hospital, if you go back to the hospital within 30 days, the hospital gets penalized and the average cost of a penalty uh, is about 15,200. That's the average cost of, re so hospitals are willing to pay our services to keep uh, repeat offenders, if you will, away from the hospital. So in their situation, they're more than happy to pay for our services. So it's free to the patient. For private pay folks, uh, who, let's say you're subscribing to a private duty care services, and uh, what they're doing now is they're bundling our services as part of their care. So uh, let's say uh, you have a budget of $2,000 a month for, for care. So they'll customize a care plan for you where they'll show up for a specific time, but then they'll wrap in our services. So this way, when their caregiver leaves your premises, the care continues, right? You, we, we're gonna monitor your falls. We're gonna have a remote care court checking in you at night. Uh, so. But you're right, insurance companies are starting to pay for our services as well. So uh, the, the answer is depends who it is, but uh, I'll be more than happy to share with you who are the ones that are doing it now. And uh, we've got another question over here, but before we jump into that, this is not a tech thing, but you brought up something that is on the minds, in, with your question, you brought up something that's on the minds of many Americans. And I believe the term, and I think it's an AARP thing, is the, it's called the forgotten middle. Okay, I used to call it the caught between the cracks group. You're, you don't consider yourself in the affluent. You don't qualify for subsidies. You did everything right, but you're in the middle and you're really watching your dollars. And I think one of the things that I've observed from technology and it's Neil elaborated on it is, is that if a home healthcare person costs $35 an hour and you can't afford eight, five days a week care, if technology can imp support that, you could be saving thousands of dollars there. So that's one of the cool things about technology in terms of affordability. We've got another question here. Thank you for taking this call. Um, a couple of questions. We covered uh, products, you covered uh, monitoring systems, you covered um, many. Uh, so the the way all this data from different systems different devices uh, they need to have some sort of an integration they have to they, they need to interwork too well otherwise you will have this ocean of all these devices all these monitoring systems they don't want to they will not talk to each other say for example you have a, a patient monitoring system providing data to a doctor's office CVS, if I go to a CVS pharmacy, they say, I'm having this palpitation or this happening or something. They will not have access to that data. So as an organization, as a community, as this, what is being done to standardize and make sure these types of data and systems are interworking? Otherwise, the costs will escalate. Um, well, so first, yes, that's a real problem. Um, and that's something that is like being handled right now at the federal level in which there are um, different commissions that are working to set standards. Um, because in uh, healthcare, like you do have like standards like HL7, um, how EHR solution, electronic health records are have to transmit data. But in this in, uh, ecosystem of Internet of Things and other types of solutions, um, there are no real standards that are in place. And so um, part of what's happening CTA is doing on the consumer side in terms of um, helping to bring uh, large companies together and they're actually Apple, Google of the world, like we're going to create interoperability across smart home. Um, but like that hasn't started to bleed over into the health um, sphere. And so there are um, different organizations in addition to the federal government that are really starting to look and tackle these problems. Um, but like it is something that needs to be solved. Yeah, I was just going to add that at HIMS again, I will find the deck. So if anyone is interested, I can send you this deck. Um, but at HIMSS, they were talking about this interoperability piece around data. And there are some fine line elements, including in the EHR, in the a, um, medical records and specifically around privacy. So there's a piece there that, that is a fine line. 
but how these things, if you're at a CVS and you have your smartwatch and then you go, I don't know, to another place and how these things communicate, they are trying to address that from a private sector um, vantage point as well. I'll, I'll just say from the, what Brian was sharing about the, the consumer side standards, you know, one of the big topics we have in the industry right now is the matter standard, which is essentially previously, if you were buying smart home products, you tended to get siloed into different ecosystems. This standard is enabling those different technologies to work across each other. So you can, you know, buy something through Apple at one point and then add on something through Google and so on, um, or kind of the various peripheral devices. So, but that doesn't go to the healthcare uh, side as far as moving that data around. So yes, as far as the devices in your home, they're working on a standard that's bringing everything together, but then it's a question of where that data goes. Yeah, and, and one great add on to your question is having an advocate that can help you understand your what you're trying to accomplish and figuring out what uh, technology might work. And Joan Green, who spoke earlier, who you'll meet in the afternoon panel, people like Joan are helping people sort of navigate this and, and hopefully you don't buy something that's not compatible with something you already have. So we got another question here. A statement first, uh, one organization, I'm with a village as well, and uh, Mill Creek Village, and my name's Joe Isaacs, and a number of the villages in Montgomery County are getting trained as administrators for uh, their villages in helping with technology applications with a, a group in New York called Dorot. It's, a, it's an Israeli term, but uh, it's, it's advancing our ability to help our neighbors. Uh, on the other side of the equation is I'm dealing with someone who um, really wants help just getting her emails, but she goes crazy with pop-up ads. And, and the fear is every time I speak and Alexa's on, suddenly I get inundated with ads of what I talked about, whether it's a trip to Italy or, you know, uh, and um, what's being done about that? Because, you know, uh, the elderly don't want to be inundated with ads whether it's, uh, you know, uh, oral or uh, 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 it within the computer. So that's a real concern. It's part of the invasion of privacy. It's great, great to ha capture preferences, but if those preferences are gonna inundate you with information you don't want, you'll turn them off to the technology. So just a question there. Great question. I'll kick off, you know, just to, to start off saying uh, it's great uh, to see what you're doing with the Rote and the Villages. Uh, that's a, another program that we've been funding and working with. And um, I love the village model because it really brings everything to, to the local level. Um, so it's great to see so many of the villages represented uh, here in the, the room. You know, I think one of the challenges uh, with advertising is you know, we're seeing more and more of the browsers start to build in ad blockers and pop-up blockers and other things along those lines to make them more consumer friendly um, because it can be overwhelming. And, you know, the other piece is making sure they have some sort of antivirus or anti-malware uh, on their computer because sometimes it's not actually in the browser. It something gets installed on the computer and starts popping things up. Um, so it may be worth trying to see if you can, you know, run a scan of their computer um, and, you know, certainly making sure that they have, you know, a lot of the browsers have blocks uh, built in that you might be able to use, or you can download a plugin to uh, help with some of that. And there's also some senior specific web browsers that have been developed, such as, uh, I think it's Silver Surfer um, and other apps that you might be beneficial and, um, email apps that have been designed for seniors to account for some of those specific um, types of things that you referenced. Um, and then there are specific devices that have also been developed for older adults. So um, the- Grandpad. Uh, Grandpad, exactly right. Grandpad is one example on which um, it's a more locked down device in terms of, you know, uh, in order to in provide more enhanced privacy and prevent those types of pop-ups. Um, and a simpler design for people who might, um, you know, have a lower level of digital literacy and confidence. I was just going to add, you raised a really great point, which is when I go back to where I started in the panel, 
um, one of the challenges that family caregivers have in addressing the needs of their loved ones in home is exactly that around privacy. So it's the cost and then it's also the privacy matter because people do not want that happening or fear big brother watching. Yeah, and, and one add on to all this is you're lucky if you see the ads, okay? If you see those crazy ads and it's annoying, but what we all need to be really careful about, regardless of our age or ability, are the things that we click on that we don't realize that are ads that are gathering information. And I highly recommend everybody, I bet you Senior Planet has some classes on how to protect yourself and how to minimize the chance you think you're getting a uh, email from your long lost cousin and it's a spammer. And this ties in directly with loneliness and isolation because a lot of the folks that are clicking on these emails are alone at home and they get this friendly email and they click on it and then all heck breaks loose. So, uh, so get some training. I bet you Joan can connect you with some um, resources there it's too. It's not even, I want to interject, it's not even the email, it's even the phone calls. There oh. are crazy things happening with AI where you get the phone call and it sounds like your loved one. And there was a case where a woman went down a, a whole path, almost sent money to kidnappers. So yeah, there, ARP has a lot of resources around fraud for that. Yep. No, no. Yeah, they have a, a, an, another 1-800 hotline for fraud and um, the ARP Fraud Network. So I absolutely encourage you to go to that. Uh, and if anyone is asking you to go buy gift cards to send to them because they need money, it's not who you think they are. Yeah, um, and a good way to check this is you get a text, you get an email, you think it's from somebody, call them on the phone, you know, and verbally talk to them. That's a good thing to do anyways. Okay. Thank you. This is a great session and we are all enjoying it, uh, looking at the active participation uh, with all the issues with safety and cybersecurity, especially with, uh, with age. When you were not born in the internet age, your grandkids and great grandkids are, um, you still need a bridge with all this wonderful technology. You still need to put a human face to it, especially for uh, geriatric people living by themselves to kind of you know differentiate what is a scam, whether it's a telephone call, whether it's an email, or uh, you know who do I trust? If I'm aging alone, if it is not today, but nobody gets younger, who do I trust? I need a human face to all this technology business. Believe it or not, that's the best tell. I understand this can be very overwhelming, but when I can add a face to all this technology, even if it is a once a month visit, or you know, I know when I need, I can have somebody stop at the door. I, I think um, I will be feeling a lot less overwhelmed well, as a senior, though I'm not yet there, but I will be someday. I brought my mother to listen to this, who goes to an adult medical day center. Um, and I took a day off from my work. Uh, I I'm a high school teacher at MCPS. And I said, and I'm also a special ed teacher uh, dealing with uh, teenagers with uh, disabilities. And I thought, you know, um, I see people a lot less overwhelmed when I can add a face to all of these beautiful things that are on offer. In the community. I just want to piggyback on what you said. I think it's the intergenerational, and Ryan said it earlier, there's an intergenerational call to action. So it's not just the onus being on older adults or not yet older adults, but it's also this idea of it takes a village. And so I, I just uh, applaud what you said. I think that from ARP's vantage point, we have been looking at that inner, inner it's a mouthful, intergenerational approach to how do we help people thrive in community at the community level and um just want to say could congrats i like what you said yeah and i would just say for any parents in the room who have kids it's important to teach your kids as they're engage, engaging with older adults to have that level of patience with technology and really have empathy when working with older adults in this space because um, the last thing anyone wants is to have someone who feels really frustrated um, when you're asking them a question because that really lowers people's confidence and even the willingness to ask for help in the future. So I think um, in building these intergenerational programs too, we really have to lead from that place of empathy and common understanding because um, oftentimes, you know, even when there are intergenerational programs, sometimes they are not successful because we don't start from that common area. 
Okay, I'll just add one more thing. Um, I forgot. We have the disrupt aging classroom, which I don't think is suited yet toward, but we are thinking about how do we target high school students. Disrupt Aging Classroom is a program through AARP. I happen to be one of the facilitators. And we go into the college courses to teach, it's a two-day program to teach students across all disciplines what it means to age in place, how to look at age as just that, a number, and not necessarily the only label. And then how do we think about disrupting aging in terms of how we interact with each other? So that's another resource that I could point people to as well. Yeah, and, and just one more resource on that. There is um, an organization called Generations United, and they did a resource toolkit in collaboration with Leading Age LTSS Center on how to do intergenerational program. And they actually built in some of these types of um, conversations, guides, and things for like training both sides. So I would um, encourage folks to look that up. I just want to carry off of, I agree with everything was said in the panel. Um, what you said is it, it hits it straight on. Uh, that's the reason why we built our company. Uh, technology is not enough. It's that human element that really makes a big difference. Um, really funny story. Uh, when we're about to discharge them from our telehealth solution, oftentimes they'll say, wait a second, when you unplug my telehealth, that means you're unplugging Maribel and Oscar, you know, who I speak to every day. Because our remote care corners, they all work from home. And, uh, and they often invite their kids to be part of the conversation, their pets to be part of the conversation. And, and lately I've been working with Barbara, we've been recruiting 50 plus remote care coordinators and they are fantastic folks who can really have a, a, that direct, uh, easier connection with the seniors because they can relate better. And so, uh, yeah, so the human element absolutely is a, is a, is a, is a critical part. All right, we got, we're going to do one last question for this session, and then we're going to take a break, but, uh, but, I, but it hasn't come up yet, but I want to share with you all some technology that addresses that last question that I love talking about with older adults and all of us in general. And this is technology that you can use with a rotary dial phone. Do you guys remember those? I got one in my house. Okay, it's called Go Go Grandparents, because doing an uber and lyft ride on one of these things it, i'll tell you it's a pain in the butt okay you can't talk to the driver you can't do any of that go go grandparents if you look it up 800 number you call and you can get an uber or lyft ride and you don't need a smartphone you don't need anything and they're expanding into other services as well so we got an, uh, a question here and then we'll wrap up thank you i have a question about finances um, many older adults are willing to give up their kitchens to have a caregiver come in and cook food, or they're willing to have somebody clean the house, or they're certainly willing to use um, um, IA for, for uh, virtual telemedicine. The last thing they're usually willing to give up is their finances. And those are something that often is needed, uh, where older adults need to increase the HOA coming out of their account, but they can't access the bank accounts anymore easily because the IA stops them. Um, they have difficulty paying their bills on a regular basis. Uh, those are the kinds of things that I haven't heard talked about because the banks aren't in on this. Uh, they aren't discussing anything with older, older adults that I know of yet. And I'm saying this because I'm looking after several older adults who don't have families, but who are stuck getting their bills paid and terrified that someone's going to steal their money. I love my bank, but man, it's a pain in the butt, isn't it? Uh, you know, credit cards, really great question. Are there any initiatives out there to get more mainstream organizations that have this, these digital platforms to make it easier for all of us? Uh, well, um, so I, I, there are kind of um, financial technology literacy courses that are offered. So again, I would turn to Senior Planet, who I do, does education in this space. There's also um, organizations and solutions such as um, Silver Bills. Was, um, well, I'm, there's a couple that are listed on the ARP website. Uh, yeah, <laughs> that these companies will actually help individuals manage their finances, pay their bills on time, um, and you can enroll in their services. So if you know someone who is having difficulty um, being able to manage their finances, those are those types of solutions. Um, but you brought up a, like a really good point around the comfortability of people 
um, doing online banking because, you know, oftentimes in um, conversations I've had with older adults, even my own grandparents, like my grandmother um, did not want to uh, move her uh, account online because she thought that someone was going to steal her money if she was, um, you know, had an online banking account. So I think a lot of that has to come from an education perspective to show um, folks, the safety around um, online banking, good practices related to it in order to have them set up and feel comfortable. Um, and then, um, you know, I'm not sure if other folks have kind of things to add in that conversation. Silver bills? It is silver bills. Um, there are resources on AARP's website that we can, um, if you want to ask me afterwards, I can share the link. It's very slow in here. But... All right. Well, folks. It's, it's on the screen. Okay. Uh, this has been awesome. Uh, I, what a great panel. Let's give them a big round of applause. <clears throat> and now, uh, panel, let's give the audience a big round of applause because you guys were great. And now we've got Wayne to come up, who's going to say a few words here before our break, correct? Thanks, Steve, and thank you all for coming. Uh, my name is Wayne Berman. I'm a commissioner with the Montgomery County Commission on Aging. And uh, it's my pleasure today to uh, announce three newest, the three newest recipients of the Commission on Aging's Community for Lifetime Award. They are Dr. Odile Burnetto, uh, Ms. Elva Jadlin, and GROWS, the Grassroots Organization for the Well-Being of Seniors. And it's being represented by its president, Megan Sexton. I ask you all to please come forward. I'll tell you a little bit about the Community for Lifetime Award. And each folks, each of these recipients will have a, a few moments to say a few words and we'll stay for pictures, but you guys can go to lunch afterwards. How's that? Um, the mission of the Commission on Aging is to enable older adults to live quality of li quality, quality lives regardless of their abilities so that Montgomery County can be a community for a lifetime. The purpose of the Community for Lifetime Award is to formally recognize the important and beneficial work being done in the county to contribute to this mission. The commissioners on the Commission on Aging nominate potential award recipients that are then selected by a panel representing the community. Our first recipient, Dr. O'Neill Brunetto, is Chief of the Aging and Disability Services for Montgomery County Department of Health and Human Services. Dr. Brunetto is recognized with his Community for Lifetime Award because she is a vital partner, leader, and innovator in enabling programs and services for older adults in the county. She is a respected voice for older adults of every community and background in the county, and a cherished role model, role model of excellence for all. Dr. Bonetto, here is your award. Congratu Congratulations. Congratulations. Thank you so very much. Well, thank you, Commission on Aging. Um, it's a very moving moment for me, so I'd, I have prepared some very short remarks because I know we want to hear from the other awardees and uh, you need a break too. So I'm just going to say very shortly that I'm truly very honored and really moved to receive this, this award today. Uh, and it is really a source of great pride for me. Um, and I will remember this day for the rest of my life. So thank you, Commission on Aging for the amazing work you have done for decades. This, this group of commissioners is totally outstanding. And uh, you can see that the quality of the work that they do is represented today um, with this particular session. But this is something that they do every day for us in our community as volunteers. So I am extremely honored. Thank you so much. Thank Congratulations again. Our second recipient is Ms. Elva Jadlin, 
This award is being given to Ms. Jalen in recognition of her long-term service and program leadership to older adults in the Latino community in Montgomery County as a, health as a volunteer health promoter. She has been active in bringing resources to improve the health and well-being of this community for over the last 20 years. Elva, congratulations. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, our third recipient is an organization, the Grassroots Organization for the Wellbeing of Seniors, AKA GROWS. Grow, the GROWS program is receiving this award in recognition of the long-term service and program leadership to older adults in the community in Montgomery County uh, that GROWS and its members have provided. GROWS is a vital partner in helping to advance programs and services for older adults in the county and contributes to the important work being done by many people, organizations, communities, associations, and agencies in the county. Accepting the award today for GROWS is Ms. Megan Sexton, the president of GROWS. Megan, congratulations. Absolutely. Hi, everybody. I'm going to take this moment to shamelessly plug, plug Gross. so please just bear with me. I do have a few board members here with me today, and I know there are some other Gross members in the room, so if you all would like to join me up front, you'd be more than welcome. This is such an honor, and we would like to thank the Commission on Aging for honoring Gross with the Community of a Lifetime Award for 2023. My name is Megan Sexton. I'm a financial planner for Edward Jones by day, and I am the president of Grows by Night. Um, I am joined by fellow board members up here, and we would really have to say thank you to all of the Grows members for their continued commitment and work for the senior population and their families in Montgomery County. For over 30 years, we have continually offered education, resources, and connections to the members, and most importantly, to our community. By providing opportunities for senior services providers to interact and learn, they are better able to make appropriate and thoughtful referrals for services they otherwise might not be aware of. These connections are key in securing Montgomery County as a community for a lifetime and will ensure that our county's older adults have access to the abundant services available to them. Grows does have an uh, table in the exhibit hall today, so please feel welcome to visit us after you're done in here. We are very proud of the fact that several GROWS members serve on the COA and report on the activities and concerns of the COA so that GROWS can stay up to date, support, and advocate for everything that COA is doing. Thank you again for this honor, and on behalf of all of the GROWS members, we are extremely pleased to accept this award. Thank you. Thank you, Megan. And thank you to all of our recipients. Please stay up front here for a little bit because I want to say a few more words and then we're going to take a few photos. And then I want to invite all of the commissioners that are in the room also not to go to lunch, but to come up here and, and uh, we want to take a group photo at, at some point here very soon. So just to continue and finish up, uh, the efforts of these outstanding recipients support the Commission on Aging's mission. I want to thank them all again for their dedicated work and work that they are doing to make Montgomery County a community for a lifetime. I would also like to take a moment to thank the community, the community members who participated on the panel to select these outstanding recipients. Sean Brennan, Jana Zalen, Marsha Prezan, Katie Smith, and Yvette Monroe. So please join me in another round of applause for the commissioners and um, enjoy lunch and we'll see you at 12.30. So we're gonna do a little photo op here. And uh, if you think that panel was great in the morning, please come back in the afternoon. 
Uh, you heard a little preview, and uh, we, we hope to see you back. And for those on Zoom, take a break, and we'll be here when you come back. Thank you.
got to put Lori on the phone. Oh, yeah. Yeah, she's an actor. Yeah, right now. Yeah. 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 Y
I see. Um, let me see. David, yeah. I, I don't have the link uh, right now, but he can probably give you the link. Let me, let me see.
So I grew up, I grew up in
Does that sound good? Testing. 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 Hello. Hello. Is that loud? Hello. Welcome back, everybody. Uh, I'm going to just hand it over to our moderator for the afternoon session. Galena Ritz is from University of Maryland, and she's going to kind of kick it off with something we heard in the morning session about intergenerational programming to help older adults. So we have a, a video message, and I'm going to hand it over to you. Thanks. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, everybody, I'm so excited to be your moderator this afternoon for this wonderful session. Uh, before we uh, start with the video, I quickly wanted to introduce our absolutely amazing panel. Um, I wanted to start with uh, Leah Bradley, who is the executive director of Empowering the Ages. Maybe, oh, well, maybe they can they could do a little wave. Uh, Joan Green, who is the founder of Innovative Speech Therapy. Uh, Mitzi Herrera, Montgomery Connects Program Director, Office of Broadband Programs. And Kathleen Williams, Director, Healthy Communi Communities, Holy Cross Health. Um, we have a very exciting conversation planned for this afternoon. We're really excited to hear from you as well. And we will kick off the program with video remarks from Dr. Monifa McKnight, Superintendent of uh, MCPS. Here we go. Hello. I am Dr. Monifa McKnight, Montgomery County Public Schools Superintendent, serving over 162,000 students and their families. First, I am delighted to be invited to participate with the Commission on Aging in its important conference on technology and aging to celebrate Older Americans Month. As superintendent, I deeply believe in the value and necessity of creating stronger bond among all generations. I have seen firsthand the value of inviting older residents and retirees into our community to interact with the Montgomery County Public School students. I'm one of our county's most resourceful, experienced, and dedicated individuals are its retired and older individuals. You provide an incredible resource to our students and school communities. The current demands on MCPS and the needs of students and their families beckon a renewed interest and a significant increase in intergenerational partnerships. With the proper programs in place, I think you will agree that the potential for older residents to contribute to the education and well being of MCPS students of all ages and abilities is enormous. If we've learned anything from the pandemic, the effective use of technology has become necessary for many of our students. It can also help our older community members learn new tools and build new skills. I am committed to supporting the intergenerational work in our county. Last month, you may know, we organized a conversation with intergenerational leaders about how MCPS can promote and incorporate intergenerational activities within MCPS learning environments for students pre-K through 12, and how we can partner to create relationships that are mutually beneficial to our seniors. At that meeting, we created an intergenerational work group led by the MCPS Community Fellows, who are key advisors to me and in conjunction with Leah Bradley, who is with you today. Following this video, she will share additional information about some of the ideas that are being considered in that work group. I firmly believe intergenerational programs are a win-win-win for students and people such as yourselves who may be a little older. Studies have shown 
that high quality relationships among people contribute to healthier outcomes by reducing loneliness and social isolation. Technology is essential in our lives today, but let's remember the importance of relationships, especially intergenerational relationships. Your knowledge and experience are essential to our success in making Montgomery County a community for a lifetime. Before I go, I would like to thank Wayne Berman and David Engel for inviting me today. And I wish you a productive and exciting forum. Thank you for allowing MCPS to be an important part of your mission and for bringing all of us together to make Montgomery County a strong and vital place to live, grow, and educate in the years ahead. What? We can clap, that was a wonderful message. Great, uh, we'll kick it off with uh, Leah who will continue the conversation. Uh, Bradley, I'm the executive director of Empowering the Ages, and we are an organization that aims at strengthening. Let's see if I can. We we strengthen the social emotional well being of older and younger individuals by connecting them in meaningful ways. So specifically, we work in this area in school readiness, civic engagement, and workforce development. Our vision at Empowering the Ages is a community where people from all generations contribute to each other's well-being, feel connected, and are valued for their unique skills and perspectives. So we're going to play a little video that explains what we envision as being part of a community that embraces everyone.
So that video to us So that video to us embodies all the values of empowering the ages. We believe in community and we know all of you do too. And that's why you're here today. We're focused on aging in place and being able to stay in your community. We also believe in relationships and how relationships are so powerful. And that's why there's technology to support, but we also know that you need to be in person and have a relationship also. We believe in innovation and partnerships as well as inclusion, diversity, and equity. We know that intergenerational relationships are critical for communities. Social interactions are at the heart of the functional society. And so those interactions between older and younger are a natural and healthy mechanism to exchange knowledge, values, and skills. As mentioned in Dr. McKnight's video, effective program has positive outcomes for health and well being, as well as reducing isolation and self worth, uh, increasing self worth for older adults as well as helping everyone gain specific skills and increasing self-esteem for younger folks. So to us at Empowering the Ages, intergenerational is a great strategy to address technology. We all know that adapting to technology is not always intuitive, but it is beneficial and contributes to healthy aging. We also know that forming a program around technology can meet the needs that multiple folks have in, for various areas of their life. Teens can teach and support seniors one-on-one -on -one with technology and help seniors become more technologically capable and increase skills that are gonna lead them to a higher quality of life. But we also know the adults have so much to give as they share their wisdom, experiences, and they become part of these supportive relationships that we know that youth need also. So as noted by, by Dr. McKnight, intergenerational programs are win-win-win. Win for the older generation, win for the younger generation, and a win for the whole community. Through intergenerational technology programs, there's so many areas to explore. We know that youth can teach and support adults as they learn social media, smartphones and iPhones, how to use a camera on a phone, how to do a telehealth appointment or log on to a medical portal, help with understanding how to begin online banking or online shopping, also in terms of searching up family history or pictures that bring about memories from the past. It's also a way to teach new skills, share new information, and maybe help folks with new hobbies. We also know there's a lot happening in the county with requiring technology. Teens can help teach how to use an app to pay for the county parking. There's also the ability to learn how to do video chats, to speak and see grandchildren, as well as learning how to complete and sign forms online. There are so many opportunities to have teens working one-on-one -on -one with adults to really help adults get their technology needs met. We also heard earlier this morning about the importance of entertainment for adults. And so we can add smart speakers and smart TVs to this list. We can also have teens help adults create playlists so that as folks wanna hear music, they can hear all their 
favorite music in an easy manner. There's a lot of ways that we can continue to brainstorm and get creative as we look for solutions to helping adults with their technology needs. So at Empowering the Ages, our goal is always to meet everyone where they are. We want to meet everyone at their ability level, their income level, their resource level, and help everyone meet their own individual needs. So as you'll hear shortly, there's a lot going on with Senior Planet. And so what we'd like to figure out is where in the county can we support what's already happening? Where can we support the classes at Senior Planet and add one-on-one -on -one support to those or other opportunities to do individual training? We're currently looking at ways to have regular training at libraries, senior centers, community centers, and within MCPS schools. As Dr. McKnight noted, there's a new intergenerational committee that's brainstorming on many topics, one of them being technology. So one of the areas that we're looking at is potentially bringing adults into school buildings where the students are and having opportunities for one-on-one -on -one support. We have talked about potentially an MCPS tech support team. So it complements the other types of hotlines and classes that are already going on in the county. The, the one area that I was thinking about with this morning is one of our speakers mentioned tech adoption as being one of the challenges. You might get a new iPhone or an iPad, but not knowing how to work it, it stays in a box. One of the most interesting intergenerational programs that I ever had the opportunity to learn about took place at a library in Massachusetts. And with a few days after Christmas every year, they would have lots of teens on site at the library and encourage everyone to bring their brand new Christmas presents in the boxes and get one-on-one -on -one support to be trained. That's something that we could consider doing here. I do believe there's a lot of creative ways that we can meet all the needs of the seniors here in Montgomery County. So with that, I'm going to end my part of the presentation. And I know that I have a lot of colleagues here who have a lot to share and I'll be able to answer questions after all the initial presentations. Wonderful, thank you so much. Uh, can you still hear me? Yep. Okay. Wonderful. Uh, thanks so much, Leah. Uh, I would I would like to chime in and say that uh, don't forget the university students as well. We actually have a couple of master students here today from University of Maryland, and it's such a wonderful experience uh, building that intergenerational bond. And we've had quite a few initiatives between the university. Um, and the local community. And it's such an amazing relationship. We had storytelling classes and a lot of um, uh, friendships that were built between um, our students and the community. So don't forget about us. The, the universities are always excited to lend a hand and we have a lot of knowledgeable uh, technology students. So uh, wonderful, thank you so much. Um, I'll hand it off to Joan next. She'll talk about the promise of Elder Tech. I have, I have about 10 minutes, so I'm going to set my timer. I'm going to open up the clock app, go on the bottom where it says timer, and start. <laughs> so I have a nice visual representation of how much time I have left. And I'm going to take off my mask. You may have seen, I think I'm the only one in the room. Can you hear me well enough? This is really great for people with hearing impairments. Both of my parents have a tough time hearing, even with hearing aids. And when they are in the hospital trying to listen to people, I mean, it is so hard with masks. So I really encourage you, these are equal to surgical masks, not N95s. So this is actually the first time I'm wearing it because since my dad is immunosuppressed, I haven't been going to anything in person. This is the first, first meeting, but the numbers are low. So hopefully things will go well. Any of the clickers? What do I point it to? 
I go to the right, right? Yeah. Oh. So I'm a speech pathologist and assistive technology specialist and an online tech advisor and coach. I've merged all these fields together. I also have four grown children and two adults and I'm very much immersed in elder care. And I have seen such a need for seniors to be taught how to use technology to engage in this world. And we've all been talking about all the benefits today, but really when you get down to it, it's hard to learn this stuff and you need people by your side providing ongoing support along the way. And at the end of the presentation, I think I have a solution that may be good, but we need funding. <laughs> so the first step is to learn what's possible. And so that's what I'm really gonna focus on today. And I'll be, I'm gonna try not to be redundant if something's already been talked about, I'll probably skip it. I have too many slides to cover, but in the back of the room, I created this QR code. You'll see it and I'll leave it. So anyone that wants a copy of the slides, my link will be available. I think people online have access to it. it uh, they printed it out in the back, but if you take open up your camera and you point it to this little square, it will open up with a, um, you just touch the notification and you can get my handout right sent to your email. So it's really easy. So there, are, I work with children and adults of all different abilities. So here, when I'm talking about adults, this could also be the same slide when working with students, right? Everybody, the trick is, is it's great to have schools, you know, college students and students um, in MCPS helping seniors, I'm all for that, but it really needs to be customized and see, everyone has special needs. You need a personal approach to really match a person's strengths and interests and needs with what they, with what they can do. And then using all the built-in accessibility features and cool devices to be able to make that happen for the person. So a lot of the mainstream tech and the way that the younger kids use it presents a lot of difficulty for older adults or people of all ages with different kinds of challenges. So, you know, whether you have a head injury or a stroke, I mean, that's my background is helping adults with in hospitals. But, you know, speaking, understanding, reading, writing, um, socializing, we've talked about the impact with so, um, isolation, remembering, planning and organizing, keeping our brains active and engaged. Technology can really help with all of that. And these are my favorite tech tools that I tend to use the most when I'm providing online tech advising with families or I train lots of speech pathology practices and other groups. So, uh, you know, whether you're using a laptop or an iPad or a watch or the Echo Show on the bottom right, um, you know, or Google or, you know, the smart AI, that we have to know how to use them. And a lot of them have great built-in accessibility features that a lot of people don't realize exist. And so it's important whether you're using a Microsoft computer or you're using um, you know, Apple, always check out the settings, the accessibility settings, because there's a lot built in right in there that you might not know about to help with hearing or speech or dexterity. And so I, I don't have much time, I have five and a half minutes left. So I'm just gonna point out some of the, the lowest hanging fruit of how to get more out of your devices. So everybody can um, turn your speech into text. So if typing is hard, if you're on a phone, you, you have the ability to talk and have it turn into type um, or on any computer or in any browser. You just have to figure out how and you can search for it or the shortcuts I've listed on the right. And again, anybody can have this handout. Also, if, you're on, if you have a smartphone in the keyboard, there's already a microphone. You might have to turn it on, but you can just say anything you wanna type. And sometimes it's hard if your speech isn't very clear, you have aphasia, or dysarthria, or an accent that your computer doesn't understand, you can send an audio message so that um, it creates an audio file as opposed to turning it into text. So for some people, that's a nice workaround. Also captions, every um, presentation tool, PowerPoint, Google Slides, Zoom, they all, the TV, all of them have built in automatic captioning these days. So even if you have a free Zoom account before you set up the meeting, make sure you enable captioning so if users choose to want to see it, they can. 
Also, all of your phones, smartphones, computers, tablets, all of them can read out loud to you. So anybody that has visual problems or reading problems, you can choose to listen to the text read out loud. You have to go into the accessibility features to figure it out. I'm not gonna have time to show this, but if you get my slides, you'll be able to click on a link. Immersive Reader is what's built in now to Microsoft Word and Word 365. Um, if you're a Microsoft person, and it has incredible ability to read aloud and you can dictate into it and you can change the view of the text. So here's an example if you're a Chrome user, or the Chrome browser, I looked up an article the other day in the post and this is what it looks like on the computer. But there are, I'm, you can see I have a bunch of bookmarks and on the top row, those are Chrome extensions, many are free. And so if I click on a Chrome extension, which is called that post light reader, it just gets rid of all the ads and it, it sets it up so that I can read more easily and I can choose if I want large print or smaller print, and then I can have things read out loud. So if you're in the edge browser or Safari, they often have built in readers, you'll just see a bunch of horizontal lines up at the top. Another one of my favorite tools, this, these are my parents and my seven month old twin granddaughters, and we do a lot of FaceTime together. And so my parents don't do great with Zoom because they have trouble hearing. Even if there's the captions, they have a little trouble seeing. <laughs> so they do best on their own iPhone with their hearing aids directly connected so that they can, see, they can hear in their ears with their hearing aids what's going on. And I can have all my kids, I have four grown kids, like we can all be on at once. And that is just the greatest way to communicate. But if, if people don't have access to a smartphone or can't use it, um, there are a lot of other devices out there now. There is the Echo Show, but there's also the GrandPad, Sociavi. There's one called OnScreen that's connected to the TV and view clicks. And I, I have a free webinar coming up where I go over all of these. There are also some simplified phones for people that can't use smartphones. And then the smart assistants that many people have talked about. Um, I mean, I, my, my dad was in the hospital for three weeks with COVID. The only thing he wanted was his Echo Show. Nothing else, that's all he wanted. So he could do video calls, he could listen to his music, he could make a phone call. I mean, it was fantastic, but there are a lot of ways that, that they can help you. And one thing I wanted to make sure to give a shout out to is a new app called Google Lens. Has anyone used it? It's unbelievably good. So if you're on Android, you can download the Google Lens app. If you're on an iPhone, you download the Google app. And then you'll see that you can take a picture. That's the symbol. You can point it to any sign or anything in the environment and it can either translate it for you or it can read it out loud to you. And it doesn't even have to process it. It's almost instantaneous. Really fantastic. I don't have time to show you a little demo of it. This, this quick how-to video, I'm gonna show you how to use Google Lens on an iPhone to Sorry, you can watch that on your own time. Also embracing the cloud, digital calendars, Google Drive, Microsoft OneDrive, keeping your documents online so that you can share them with each other. And you can password protect PDF files, but it's a really nice way if someone's in the hospital or you're, you're take, helping parents or grandparents, you can have access to a lot of the same documents and both edit them. Um, so here's just digital calendars. Again, you can go through this on your own time. And then there's some cognitive exercise apps. And so depending on a person's cognitive ability, if they're really sharp, they might wanna try something like con constant ther or, um, lumosity, or if people have some challenges, they might try constant therapy. I mean, I, I know about all of them because I make it my business to know about them, but there are a lot. I, AARP has a great game site there and there's a MindMate app. And so it's all about figuring out the needs of the user and then matching it with the app that's available if they like that kind of things. But the biggest question I keep bringing up here is where can you get help to figure out about all this and not break the bank? Because I'm expensive. I, people hire me, but I charge a lot of money. But I'm always trying to take advantage of what's available in the county. And so here I gave a shout, I did a search. Montgomery County has one Tech Connect class. I was so disappointed when I went through the Department of Recreation and Senior Centers in Montgomery County, I didn't find anything until I realized it's Senior Planet that's providing the services in the senior centers. And that's 
that's where that's all happening. But it, I didn't. I knew about Senior Planet. I just didn't know that that was happening in the senior centers. And the city of Rockville has a lot of really good courses. Uh, Montgomery County Public Library System. I thought taught classes. I couldn't find any. But what they? I think one location and only might. But the Libby app and the Hoopla app, which are free, those uh, you can get digital books, um, audio books, and regular books. Oasis, I remember I taught a class there about 20 years ago and still exists in Montgomery, what I call Montgomery Mall. And it's really terrific. They've got a lot of great classes there. And so I just, I haven't been hearing much about them, um, but you know, they have a lot of really good classes there still. And then you can go to Best Buy if you need help setting things up. And they provide a terrific program now, the Total Tech Membership, because I went to all the tech stores in the areas to figure out of what they do to set people up. And Best Buy is the only game in town that I could find of a, of a computer store. And for $199, they offer an awful lot to set things up for you and provide support. Um, and Micro Center is, a lot of people ask me where I go. I go to Micro Center if I'm having trouble with my uh, technology and I, they provide great guidance when you're purchasing something. And then in terms of learning online groups and classes, I've, um, done presentations on this, but I took a special interest in Montgomery County and what we have. And you guys, I'm, I'm gonna add to these slides actually, after probably by the weekend with resources I've learned about that are offered here that I didn't know about. So of course we keep hearing about Senior Planet, that's the tech hotline number. And I put some images of their classes, it's free to join. Get Set Up is another program. It used to be free, now I think they may charge something, but they have really good classes also. Um, and another nice way to learn is YouTube videos. Once you hear about something and you wanna learn more about how to do it, you sort of need to know how to search for different things, but you can watch some videos and that's how I teach myself a lot. And there's this one guy, Rich Bolin, who's fantastic. And he has wonderful videos for seniors about how to use the iPhone and iPad. And so, you know, just watching those videos together and then pausing and practicing is a really good way to learn. And I offer free 15 minute phone calls for people all over the world. I probably do about three a day. So if you go to my website and you click on let's chat at innovativespeech.com, it's really my pleasure because it keeps me on my toes and you see my free spots up to three days in advance. You click on it and I call you at that time. And I don't, I'm not a salesman kind of person. Like I'll just try to help you figure out your next steps. Um, I also have a free Facebook group. It's all about technology, people who want to become more tech savvy to help others. Um, and I think I have about 1300 people in that now. And so, and the last thing, oh, I have two free webinars. One is coming up, I'll, it's called Beyond FaceTime, Uncovering Hidden Gems for Video Calls. And I'm going over all the options. That's June 7th. And this one um, is July 19th in Unlocking the Power of Tech for Reading, all the different reading ways that you can use tech to help with reading. And I think this is the last slide. Um, I've had two cohorts of elder tech advisors. So these are really professional speech pathologists, OTs, special educators, technology people who came together. I had 75 people total. And it was two five-week sessions. I developed a curriculum. It was a flipped approach. So they watch videos and we learned and we practiced together and they loved it, but it was all free. I didn't charge a penny and I spent so many hours on this. Then I tried to charge money and nobody signed up. So I'd really like to bring this to Montgomery County and have communities, you know, different communities, different assisted living, independent living, you know, anybody who wants to be part of it, apply. And then I'm either going to have to charge or get funding. So I'm still working that out, but I think we need that. Um, and then train the trainers so that my parents, for example, live at Ingleside at King Farm. I would love for a couple of folks from there to be in this. And then they go back and teach the classes. And then I provide support, ongoing support to all the people in the course. Um, I think we need that even with students. They don't know how to customize different accessibility features for people with different strengths and weaknesses. Um, this was just an article in the Beacon. And, um, you know, go ahead and give me a call and we'll figure out your next steps. So went a little long.
Thanks, Joan. Uh, that was fantastic. We definitely need to chat because uh, the university has a lot of support and I think it would be amazing to um, be involved in, in the initiative. And Joan and I are both super excited about tech and especially voice technology. Um, so a lot of uh, my work is with Alexa and now I'm teaching a course where students are developing skills for Alexa for older adults and accessibility. So the future is really exciting and we have a lot of involvement from all sorts of parts of the community which is wonderful. Thank you so much, such, a, such an amazing presentation. So we'll uh, hand it off to Mitzi, who will talk about really the wonderful, exciting uh, initiatives uh, that Montgomery Connects has. Mitzi? Fantastic. Hi there, hello everyone. I wanna um, say thank you to, I wanna say thank you to Odile. Uh, who has been just such a um, when they say it takes a village it, it, it's true I started out doing this work because um, I was doing economic development in Montgomery County we have 18 federal agencies and we have the FDA and NIH and we have a bunch of biotech and tech startups and almost all that new innovation is around technology designed for people who are over 60 and we said, well, wouldn't it be great if we created in Montgomery County, a place where we had the most tech savvy seniors, and then we could attract startup companies who would want to come and then they'd have like a natural base. And then COVID hit. And then suddenly all these people who said like, wow, wouldn't it be great if people at home had technology and things. And, and I'm proud to say that we've been doing Senior Planet for seven years. So it's sad that it took a global pandemic for people to get that message, but we're glad that things are moving along. I'm looking for this one. Um, so I'm going to just cover a couple key points. First is what is digital equity? Um, and you heard Scott say that it is a three legged stool. And one thing I would say is that for um, seniors, uh, it can also be a four legged table. Because what you want to have is that everybody digital equity is the state where everybody has access to home technology. For something that's going to be a tablet or a computer, it's usually more than just a mobile device a mobile phone uh, because you need a bigger screen. You're gonna have internet connectivity at home that's affordable and that is sufficient for what your needs are. You're gonna have the skills. You heard a lot of people when they talk about, we used to talk about as digital literacy, but I think what we really mean now we try to talk about is the skills that you need. And then as somebody mentioned earlier, sometimes you just get stuck and you, have, you need a helpline. And uh, I'll have it later, but I'm proud to say that Senior Planet has been offering, um, it began during the pandemic and offers a helpline where you can get help. And now the University of Maryland has launched, a University of Maryland extension, um, which has funding from the state, has launched Marylanders online. And they um, also have a center, both of those, there is help available in English and in Spanish. Um, and it's also something that we've used. Um, I save that for all these other programs that we have that the, um, the, um, the, your email address is the new social security number because you don't need a social security number to apply for a lot of these programs, but you must have email. So you can also call those numbers and they can help get you set up. The digital divide is the gap between the people who have those devices and internet and skills and the people that don't. And the work that we do for digital inclusion and digital equity is to close that gap. And one of the things I'm gonna talk about today is that digital equity and particularly those skills and having those devices is key to the smart homes and smart aging. So last year for Senior Planet, one of the things I did mention because of the pandemic, there was a lot of grants. We received a um, school and library grant in partnership with our libraries. And we distributed 50,000 free Chromebooks to county residents who did not have one. And of those over 6,600 went to people who said that they were over 60. And I believe that there were about 535 to people who said they were over 80. Um, we um, enrolled people in Maryland. You can receive $45 a month off your um, home internet or your mobile phone. If you're enrolled in a benefit program like SNAP food benefits or SSI, or your kids are in school lunch. Um, what we've, um, uh, we through Senior Planet Montgomery, we provided over 2,600 hours of instruction to uh, 3,000 uh, participants in 470 sessions. Some of those are in person, some of those are online. Some of those are five week classes. One of the things about Senior Planet, what it's really focused on is senior empowerment. 
So the idea is, is that while you may have a helpline to get you stuck, the purpose of taking the five week class is I'm confident at the end of it. It's not like somebody came and they gave me all this information all at once. And then when they leave, I don't know how to do it again. So it's a great approach in that. And then one of the things that became out of the pandemic is really using Zoom um, because it also enabled some people to, the, the in-person classes are great. So some people it's harder to get to. Sometimes you, you wanna have the companionship and sometimes people are still a little leery about going out. So we do a basic senior plan on their website has information about how to use Zoom. We offer classes, it's still actually one of our most popular ones. And we offer advanced ones like how to be the host, how to you know, do the breakout rooms, all those kinds of things. And we actually partner with the Gilcrest Immigration Resource Center they began offering all their training online through Zoom and we, they made it a prerequisite that you take the Senior Planet Zoom lecture because then they didn't have the first class of the instructors going, okay, here's the microphone, here's these things like that. Um, we are, um, we, as I mentioned, we have the, the tech line assistance. And the other thing that we've been doing is we've been partnering with the University of Maryland Extension um, they are developing curriculum. They have now licensed with Senior Planet so that that curriculum is available throughout Maryland. Um, other places can offer that training. Um, and what we're trying to feed to them as well is the needs. Um, we have put together the um, Montgomery Connects Digital Equity Coalition, a group that's across the spectrum, people who work with youth, people who work with people with disabilities, people who work with older adults, um, to try to make sure that as the state moves forward in the digital equity plan that we are... Um, um, engaged in that conversation. In the year ahead, we have another grant from the state, um, and we also got a grant from our own county health and human services to help to work with seniors specifically, and we got another grant from the Federal Communications Commission to help enroll people in um, the broadband discount program. And so we're going to roll all those things together, and what we are doing is at 50, there's about 62 senior buildings, so about we're going to target about 50 of those. We are going to have in partnership with My Active Montgomery, we are going to um, do events on site in which we help people enroll in the broadband benefit program if they're eligible. If they're eligible for that program, they can receive a computer, a Chromebook laptop from the state. It's one per household, one per address. So um, we are also, as part of that program, we are going to be giving a, an overview of how you use the library's um, digital services. We are going to provide an overview of Senior Planet. We are going to help people enroll in the Active Montgomery, which is the online registration system that you use for all the classes at senior centers. And we want to provide information about the free transportation options that you can get from the building um, to the centers. And then we'll distribute the computers and we're hoping that we're going to be able to provide a little bit of assistance so you can set up the computer and then um, install Zoom on there at those locations. For the, um, for the, as part of this, as other part of this grant, we're going to do it at another 60 um, affordable housing developments. And for those folks, um, we don't have enough funding to just deliver the computers there. So they're going to come to um, uh, like 66 events where we have where we're distributing the computers. And that's one area that we're hoping that we can get some support from MCPS and the student service learning. So Leon, I'll be talking with you. Um, because what we'd like to have is some help that's available once people get the computers. Some people can just take the computer and go home, but other people, yes, if you could help me set it up. It's the Google account. If you're used to doing it, it's not that much, but if you're a little um, daunted by it. So that's one of the things that we're looking to do there. Uh, I mentioned here is the, the call centers and those are the phone numbers. And then um, uh, what I'm excited about is we're going to do with um, Virtual Apprentice, which is a local woman-owned company. Um, and they do a lot of things where they use the MetaQuest, you know, the little VR glasses and you have the hand things. They do a lot of it for training. It's pre-apprenticeship training. So you can practice like taking a window and you're putting it in the building and you're using the caulking and doing that. But they also have this wellness retreat which is a kind of 360 experience where you kind of get the sense of like being on a beach or they have meditation. You can, I mean, they're gonna do a thing like you can walk through the Greek islands or different things, but we're gonna have nine of those headsets and we're hoping over the summer that we're going to have like at a week at each of the senior centers where you can come and we can kind of offer them um, there and have help. And then we're gonna kind of roadshow them and then we'll kind of see based on that demand, like where we kind of have them live afterwards. Um, 
We are hopeful also that through um, the recreation department, they have a teen works program and they have a tech connect, which I believe that Leah helped um, pioneer, which um, younger people are trained to work with older adults. And there's gonna be one or two embedded at each senior center doing things. And we're hoping that they're gonna also have some time so that they can be doing a kind of um, help. Like if you have a question, you can sign up for help. You can, when we have the VR glasses, that are, they'll be kind of be there and then um, promoting awareness of the other upcoming Senior Planet um, classes that are gonna be there. Senior Planet, um, these are just, I don't remember, there's like 200 different things out there. So actually, if you're out at the expo today, you'd see that we have, we've kind of been trying to do a survey for people to just tell us what you're really interested in learning. Um, on the right are, we offer everything from the foundational things to basics, so online shopping, um, some of these things, you know, looking at, at how they're associated with smart technology, these are just sort of foundational. Do I feel comfortable using a credit card and making payments? Um, do I feel comfortable using um, banking? We have um, virtual museum tours and so forth. And also very, um, both our cloud storage is very popular and protecting your personal information online. In the middle, these are kind of what I would call our, our um, um, health their, their health um, lectures and their, you can sit at your computer, you can kind of use them. But what I would say is that what we're sort of also starting to move into is specific apps, wearable devices, smart tech, which is here on the left. Um, the, um, the fitness apps and things, you know, people were talking about the fitness apps still continue to be like the most popular thing that people want to do online, but it's good because it's engaging. And when we were first doing Senior Planet, um, I had somebody out there and they were taking video and um, they, people were playing solitaire. And I was like, oh, don't shoot them playing solitaire. But as it turns out, the solitaire was an important thing because on an iPad, it teaches you to do drag and drop. It teaches you that you can touch the screen and not be afraid of it. It's like an entry and a gateway of like something that I'm comfortable with and I can learn to do other things. And the fitness things became things like people paying attention to their health things, people looking at their sleep and how much sleep I was getting or how little sleep I was getting and what changes do I need to make? Um, and all of these things is sort of addressing the senior isolation um, and, and all those things, you've got to find an entryway in there. So we offer a wide variety of things. And I'm gonna focus on this voice assistant is a new thing in which um, this really in the innovation, this video screen um, is, could set to potentially be a game changer. A lot of people have um, an Alexa or, you know, my aunt has one and we just say the, you know, woman whose name shall not be mentioned because then she turns on when you say it. Um, but the video screen really, it's sort of you just talk and it's just kind of out there or might give you information, but having the screen, like, you know, what are my doctor's appointments for today or pill reminders and all those kinds of things um, is potentially looking at that. The VR, there's a lot of really interesting um, ex, um, uh, studies going on now about dementia um, uh, and use of VR, memory and cognitive things. So we're kind of excited. That's why we actually wanted to start getting engaged in VR um, and to start to engage in that space because then you're kind of positioned to like, okay, now I've got my feet wet. What else new things can I learn? Um, a lot of the things around 5G integration, it was funny when I was putting together this lecture, when you look and kind of talk about the things that we've been doing, there's not a lot, it's, we're still talking about the same things. It's just that the tech has gotten better. It's like, if you think of, if you knew anybody who had an Apple watch and the first one they had versus the one they have now, I mean, there's just still an Apple watch, but it does so many more interesting things. We have, which I had mentioned Montgomery County, we also provide, um, we have a project called MocoNet which is a hundred megabit residential broadband service that we're putting in some affordable housing as we get funding. We have something in there that's called the plume pod. Um, it's, it gives you Wi-Fi, but it's also can be a sensor. It can do things where it can track. It has a video feature. It also has a thing of like, have you moved today? What you also find is that not all of us want to have a video camera on in our house that our kid can see. So that's a balance too. But some folks might agree too. We had a guy and he said, yeah, I would agree though. You can have a thing that's saying like, have I gotten up? Am I moving around the house? Like I'm okay with my kid knowing that, right? So um, there's different things. And we offer through Senior Planet Montgomery, we also offer um, tech talks. So there can be like a specific new thing and trying to do it. Um, one of the things that we are um, really trying to do is to um, um, put together for the, um, uh, the aging uh, friendly, age friendly, uh, is happening in October 26th. And we're trying to work to see if we can get some demos 
um, for some of this stuff so people can really see and tight and you know, not taste it, but you know, touch it um, and looking at those different things. And the, um, the last thing I would, um, well, two last things I would say is that I wanted to just call out and thank the CTA Foundation. They've done a lot of work with Senior Planet. Um, we'll hope that we'll expand that. And I think it's really great to have, you see so much tech, which is really just driven around young people. And it's really great to see that their foundation is so uh, in support of helping people with aging and disabilities. Um, this is my contact information. Some of you saw my colleague Noah out there um, how you can get in touch with us. We are um, looking to see, we're doing some chat GPT things with um, young people, and we're looking to see if there's any kind of, one of the things about chat GPT and all these things is that they have to be trained. Um, they're not so good with dealing with older adults. So we're trying to see if we can also kind of get into that area. And lastly, um, in honor of Wayne, I just wanna say to you, may the fourth be with you <laughs> and be a badass at any age. <laughs> That was wonderful. Thank you so much. Uh, a lot of exciting tech. Yes, uh, VR is a really interesting space as well as ChatGPT and GPT-4 and 5 and, you know, ro robots in our houses. Um, so I'll hand it off to Kathleen next, who will uh, talk to us a little bit about uh, technology in supporting aging in place. Kathleen, did you want to come up? Oh, sure. Thank you for, for uh, questions later, um, as long as this works. Okay, um, I'm Kathleen Williams. I am the Director of Healthy Communities at Holy Cross Health, and we'll be talking to you about technology supporting aging in place from the healthcare system. Um, I am very happy to be here as part of this panel um, and seeing lots of ways that we can uh, partner and work together in the future. Um, but right as of now, our number one use of technology in the healthcare system is our electronic medical record. Um, I know that this was briefly discussed. I walked in on the end of a question in the um, morning session um, that maybe I can answer, but not sure. Uh, but we use uh, the electronic medical record for internal and external providers to be able to communicate. It helps with coordination of care, um, identifying any gaps in care, like if there's a screening that was uh, suggested that hadn't been done yet. Um, we can then uh, use that information to make sure that we get those appointments or make those referrals. Um, the, it increases the provider communication um, and again, uh, communication across sites. Uh, so when you're being discharged from the hospital, if you go to home care or to a skilled nursing facility, that communication can happen through that electronic medical record. Um, we also use the electronic medical record to um, pull and analyze data on readmissions. Um, and that allows us to then look at um, what brings people back to the hospital and put in programs in place um, to try to help people not come back to the hospital because we do want to keep people healthy at home. Um, one of the programs that we did um, with analyzing the readmission data uh, was determining that the high percentage of people that came back um, into the hospital were from skilled nursing facilities. So in collaboration with Adventist Healthcare, we used um, real-time medical system to kind of extract data from the skilled nursing facilities, um, EHR, electronic medical record, um, and work with the providers to perform that care as appropriate in the skilled nursing facility, rather than having the patient transferred back to the hospital. I think this improves health outcomes and customer service. Um, you don't wanna, when you're feeling sick, you don't wanna move from one place to another if you don't have to. And so we were able to use that um, electronic medical records for that purpose. Um, at Holy Cross, we have EPIC, which is our uh, Together Care. EPIC is our electronic medical record. And through that, we have a patient portal called MyChart, um, which maybe we'll be able to work with senior planet on helping people understand how to sign up for MyChart, how to use MyChart. And many providers in the area across the nation use different portals. Um, probably as a customer, the most frustrating, you've got five different portals to get into. Um, if we use my chart, you can do online um, scheduling of appointments. Uh, you can review your medical records, which I have found to be. This one, this one. Oh, okay. That makes a difference. Sorry. I hope everybody heard what I was saying, but I'll answer questions later. Um, so my chart, we can do online um, scheduling of appointments. Um, we can review our medical records, um, which gives us some you know, power and autonomy in being able to advocate and support um, ourselves in our care process. Um, 
then we can send and receive messages from providers uh, within that uh, portal. CRISP is used throughout the state of Maryland. You might've seen this in your doctor's office. You have to actually opt out of CRISP. Otherwise the information from different pharmacies that you might go to different providers you may see goes into CRISP. Um, and that then also communicates with the electronic medical record that the hospitals are using. So that goes right into our Epic. And we can see if you've gone to MedStar or a hospital in another part of the nation. Most of this is used for um, continuity of care, increased communication, and increased access to be a healthcare advocate. Um, throughout our system, in different ways, we use re remote patient monitoring. This is another use of technology. Um, one of the ways is uh, if a patient needs more supervision or observation within the hospital, we're able to use sort of this uh, camera and alert system um, that keeps an eye on that patient and can alert the nurses station or other staff in the hospital to the needs of the patient. Um, and that, you know, can alleviate having a random strange human being uh, sitting next to the patient, um, making the patient sometimes uncomfortable. Um, this isn't necessarily patient monitoring, but as we all have gone through this pandemic, um, the hospital has learned to use different tablets and techniques or platforms uh, to keep connection between patient and family members. Um, so that's, you know, what we've heard here, we didn't use Zoom, unfortunately, um, but we use Teams and WebEx and different platforms um, to, again, keep people connected. Uh, if you're in the hospital and discharged and go home with home care, Home care, uh, Holy Cross Home Care, and many other home cares have some some way of um, remote monitoring for patients. At Holy Cross, we use Home Care Connect, um, which is uh, they give you a blood pressure cuff and a scale, so they can keep track of your blood pressure, notice different changes in weights, which can um, indicate different things happening within the body. You can do in the moment interventions uh, while the patient is at home, and the provider may not be there in the home. Um, as well as the virtual check-ins um, and telehealth appointments. Um, and oops, and then in the community, we've got lots of ways that we try to, again, try to keep people out of the hospitals. Um, and if we can do that, then that, again, brings about better, uh, more positive health outcomes. As you can see from the um, diagram on, on the right, uh, a lot of our healthcare doesn't happen in healthcare moments. Our health is impacted by socioeconomic um, factors, physical environment, and healthy behaviors. So um, Nexus Montgomery is sort of a collaboration between the six hospitals in Montgomery County, uh, where they came together to look at total cost of care and ways that we can, we can help keep our communities uh, uh, healthy. Uh, one of the programs that came out of Nexus Montgomery is Voice Your Choice. It's a free online tool where you can go in and get education and information about um, advanced care planning. You can develop your plan of care um, um, and share it with providers and family members. And again, it's a free online tool. It's voiceyourchoice.org. And I can put copies of this, these slides back in the back or I'll have them available if anybody wants it. Um, but voiceyourchoice.org and you again can share that advanced care planning with family and providers. Another free online tool is Find Help. It's something that we use across our system when we do social needs screenings, um, which we do in the hospitals, in our um, uh, provider practices, as well as in our community-based programs, where we um, assess the needs for uh, food, housing, um, other factors that may, again, impact your health. Find Help is it's findhelp.org, and it's available to anybody. And you can go in there if you or somebody you know has a need, uh, put in your zip code and what the need is, and resources will be displayed um, with easy access to either text the information, email the information, or directly call the, the organization that's on there um, to meet those needs. We continue with telehealth appointments with providers and electronic uh, messaging, not medicine, uh, for re appointment reminders or check-ins. Um, during for the pandemic, I mean, uh, I think March what, 9th, 2020, we were all in person, had senior fit classes in 27 places. And uh, by March 20th, we were, you know, switched to all virtual. Um, and now we have moved forward with um, some hybrid classes where we have some in person and still some virtual because 
we have found that people can attend in ways that they weren't able to attend before. Um, so we have, um, you know, again, our exercise, health and wellness classes, um, several uh, health education classes around chronic pain, um, cancer, uh, lung health, diabetes, um, those are big ones. And we have a medical adult day center that uses a lot of this technology to um, engage uh, with our participants in different ways. Um, we, we travel a lot to distant lands and love YouTube for that. <laughs> um, but I'm seeing ways to, to uh, partner with, our, with my, my panelist cohort here. Um, and then in uh, the summer of 24, which is just next summer, we're hoping to uh, open our PACE program, which is Program for All-Inclusive Care for the Elderly. Um, the um, only program like this has been uh, through Johns Hopkins in the Baltimore area until um, 2019, um, State of Maryland opened up applications and Holy Cross um, was awarded the application or awarded this for Montgomery County. So we hope to open that and use a lot of this technology and again, um, you know, uh, remote monitoring or telehealth appointments um, to engage um, our um, patients in that way. Um, so I thank you very much for having me here and uh, sharing about what we do. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, wonderful presentations. I'll kick it off with a couple of questions for our panelists. Maybe we can switch the lights on so that we get a little bit more visibility. Uh, such uh, wonderful efforts. Um, and I think uh, so much opportunity for collaboration, which is really exciting. Um, I can open it up to the audience and Steve will be my, is it Vanna White? I don't know. Everybody, there we everybody. go. <laughs> All right, we got an audience Thanks, question here. And then if there's any online, just give me the cards. Hi, can you hear me? Okay. Um, I want to talk about the patient portal problem. Um, each one of my doctors has a separate patient portal. And the only way that I can get a medical test or a medical record from Dr. A to Dr. C is for me to go to the portal, download the record, and then send it, uh, upload it <laughs> to the other portal. And I, yes, I can do that but A, it's a pain, and B, not everybody can do that. Is there any way that we can get the AMA or somebody to have a universal portal so that we don't have to do this? Great question. <laughs> I'm not sure if I'm the best one to answer that um, because yes, that would be nice if we did. And Chris is supposed to act similar to that and be able to pull the information um, from one portal to another and kind of have that central place. Um, so you might ask your doctors while we work on trying to have a, you know, a central um, portal uh, if they participate with CRISP and if they can pull the information from CRISP. Okay, let's see, any, any other audience questions? I know we're transcribing some online questions right, for- Right here in the front. Oh, we got a bunch of them here, okay. All right. Can you just tell us how to get to Senior Planet and find out what's available? Sure, in fact, I realized I should have put it more prominently. The web address is uh, seniorplanet.org forward slash Montgomery. Okay. Oh, great. Yeah. So seniorplanet.org forward slash Montgomery. And so on there, we have, um, we have a list of all the upcoming classes. You can either sort it for the ones that are just local. Um, one of the things of moving during the pandemic is that now I um, mean, doing so many things online is that Senior Planet operates in six states and they're going to open soon in Miami. Um, so you can actually get um, the other programs you can participate. It's all free. So you can also have that. I also should mention that we offer it locally in English, Spanish, and Mandarin. 
Um, and I'm proud to say that we started Mandarin, but Palo Alto and other folks have really taken off. Um, CCACC, the Chinese Community Cultural Center was really key to doing that with us. Um, and in my, my big dream is that in the next year, I would really like to be able to offer a class in Amharic. Um, and so that's what I'm sort of on the hunt for uh, funding to expand that. Um, we have seven languages in Montgomery County that are prominent, so we are hoping to do that. But the key on all of those things is partnering with the community organization. We do a lot of stuff with the Gilcrest Resource Center. You can find us through there. And we will be at all of the um, senior rec centers um, this summer and fall is a big focus for us, including um, uh, Gaither, Benjamin Gaither Center uh, as well. Okay, so um, I understand that the topic is technology that supports aging in place. But even so, we've heard about technology in hospitals and adult medical centers, in communities, at home. And I'm just wondering if anybody knows anything about technology in nursing homes. And also, we talked about intergenerational relationships, if there's any of that going on in nursing homes. Um, a little bit about nursing homes that I know of is electronic medical records. Like they have electronic medical records. They, I would imagine that has a patient portal with it. Um, and they use um, also uh, the remote patient monitoring. Um, often there are programs dependent on the diagnosis that may go from that continue the, for the continuum of care that the treatment starts in the hospital. It then trans, I'm thinking of um, congestive heart failure. Treatment may start in the hospital, then move in the continuum to the skilled nursing facility, and then move to home care. And that's kind of where that home care connect program comes in. So there's sort of this transfer from hospital to skilled nursing to home, um, and that information and training kind of follows. Um, so that's the little bit I know about the, okay. I can just um, address my personal experience. I've had my parents and mother-in-law in, in different skilled care facilities, and there's not a lot going on. They have, there are some that have groups of iPads, but really all that's done is they might facilitate a video call, but it's extremely cumbersome. Um, and it's, you know, you have to be available at a certain time and there's, there really isn't anybody in charge in most assisted living places and skilled care facilities. I think it's a crime that not more is being done to facilitate um, people benefiting from all the tech has to offer. Hence, I, we really need to have an elder tech advisor group from all these different partners and even um, even independent living places to, as a community, get come together. I mean, Senior Plan is fantastic and get set up. I mean, there, there are a lot of good programs, but where people live, there have to be trained, paid people to, su to support technology and a tech concierge in all the buildings that rotate around. <laughs> I don't think there's much going on, other than medically, maybe for documentation, but not for patient enjoyment, it, unless there's an activities director that uses some technology for a virtual, um, you know, to pretend you're at a museum. Yeah, I mean, there are a lot of good programs that the activities directors, those would be the natural people to really provide the tech teaching, I think. And I can say that um, during the pandemic, we did a lot of work with nursing homes virtually. We had concerts that youth performed and they were live streamed in various nursing home communities. We also had an email pen pal program and we had nursing home staff who would bring iPads into rooms, read the emails that youth had sent and then emailed back for on behalf of nursing home patients. We also did an ongoing conversation program with high schoolers who were online and um, nursing home residents. So we were doing quite a bit during the pandemic. Um, at this point, it's a bit more challenging because some folks are ready to, or don't want to do as much online. And many of the nursing homes are getting, just getting to the point where maybe they're, they're willing to let folks come back in. So our goal is that in summer and fall, we're back to providing more intergenerational programming in nursing homes. 
All right. Well, we've got a, uh, I'll, I'll get the live question there next, but we've got an online person that has a question. And uh, this says, someone tried to obtain medical information from 30 years ago. The records had been destroyed after 10 years. How long will electronic records remain available? Do you, do you have any thought on that? Uh, I want to say that our record retention is um, 20 years, it might be 25 um, years. Um, I would imagine that the electronic medical record can keep it for longer, um, but I think kind of storage and then, you know, cloud-based saving and all that stuff may come into play. Um, but there are um, laws and rules and regulations on record retention and how long they can be kept. And, um, and a footnote, while I'm get, coming back here to another que uh, question on the previous question about nursing homes, here's a thought, it's not a solution, but the people that work in the nursing homes and senior living communities, if they have a problem printing on their computer, they call the IT department and somebody will take care of it, right? Okay, but in most places, there's progressive places, the residents don't have an IT department to help them with their support and make sure that their software and stuff is updated. So there's a lot that can be done in, in that area there. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the woman for uh, discussing the issue with portals. Every doctor has a portal and they don't share the information and that, that's a serious problem. Um, I gave up and if my doctors wanna share, they, they talk to each other. They actually phone each other up and talk to them. Um, also, I wanted to say, has there ever been a needs assessment done with prioritization of what kind of technology is needed by senior citizens? And the third point I want to make is, you know, as a former IT person, I think it's embarrassing to me that we have not made our technology easier. Why do we have to have people come in and teach seniors how to use it? It should be more accessible. It should be easier to use. And... Uh, as I said, I used to be a, a former tech person, but I've, I've been happily retired for 10 years now, so I'm out of it. Well, I, I think she should be on the panel next year. Okay, <laughs> great questions for you all to riff on. Yeah, I, I know a number of years ago when Mitzi and I were working together before Senior Planet came, we were looking at ways to help seniors and there was a needs assessment done at that time. Um, I don't know if anything has been done more recently, but we did do a needs assessment, which gave us a sense of where geographically the needs were the most, as well as what topics we would want to get started when we looked at what type of technology curriculum to get involved with. Um, I'd say it's, it's actually an interesting question, but I'd also say that I think it's a very personal, not personal, like it's private, well, you could say it's private, but I think it's, it's very depends on the individual. Um, the, and, and the other thing is, is that when you get, what happens when I get that data? Do I have funding to provide it? Is it intended to be a personal assessment tool? So it, it, it's actually an interesting concept. If you didn't, if somebody could do an assessment and like, these are the things that I need most, maybe it's something I could talk about with the University of Maryland. These are the sort of skills or the things that I like the most assistance with. Um, that can kind of tell you, like, based on that, these might be the tech things you like. But the other, um, the, the, the Steve Jobs view of it is you never ask the customers what they want because they don't know what they want. Because how many people would have said, like, with the iPhone and all these other things that, you know, that's the thing that I want, but now is the thing that now that I use it, like, I can't live without having, you know, the Alexa turn my light on. Um, and, and the other, um, uh, a uh, piece of that is a thought I just forgot. So I'll, I'll but I'll, I'll, but I will say also on the tech piece and somebody asked about it. I do really pitch the, the helpline um, that is there through Senior Planet as well as through Marylanders Online. We did actually, the rec department during COVID gave us some of the most fantastic young employees. And we put together what we called Montgomery Connects at that time. And it was a helpline for seniors who could make appointments from like, how do I get my printer connected? How do I do this thing? Um, and then we leveraged because it's Montgomery County. So we offered in 12 languages because that's where we had students who spoke. Um, so I really do, I think it's really important 
to really leverage those helplines to kind of help you get unstuck. Um, that's how it actually led to having the classes in Mandarin because we'd have people who would call every week kind of at the same time to ask a new question. And that's kind of why we ended up launching it for that. Um, and then I think the assessment, that's kind of an interesting thing that we might have to think more about and maybe with some of the healthcare providers as a, as a kind of assessment tool for, for individuals. I just wanted to chime in from the university perspective. Uh, we struggle with this all the time and research, as you know, is really critical and we would love to sort of dive in and look at that, but it, it's um, it's very slow and, and uh, grants come in very slow and funding and uh, what we've been trying to do is do as much co-design as possible to sort of alleviate some of that because the engineers think this is brilliant and throw it out to the public and then nobody can use it. And so we're very much at UMD focused on co-design and bringing in um, older adults to talk to our students and really kind of create platforms together. So that's just a tiny part, but I 100% agree with the frustration. All right, another audience question here. Has any thought been given to setting up a the equivalent of a computer lab in Montgomery County, where you would have all these different technological devices and seniors could come and see what they look like and see how to turn it on and see how to operate it. Then they could decide what of these devices makes sense for them. Um, obviously you wouldn't, they couldn't take it home, but they could go there, try it out, see what they think. Has any thought been given to setting that up? Um, I know about the lending library up in Baltimore, but I was really thinking of something more local for Montgomery I County. Was good. Yeah, we had a discussion, but yeah. so I just wanna make sure people know about MDTAP, T is in Tom, AP. It's a technology assistance program and there is a lending library. There's a reuse place and they, they offer free webinars and they have a huge library where you can go and try out anything and terrific people there helping, but that's in Baltimore. Uh, this is uh, an initiative uh, that we're very passionate about. We're actually calling it ITAP. So TAP is very popular, uh, information technology for the aging person out of the iSchool at UMD. And that is exactly what we're trying to do on the Shady Grove campus. So it's local, we have students, graduate and undergraduate supporting, we have technology. So. Um, I'm waiting for funding support from the university, but that is exactly what, what I'd like to do. So would love to chat with you. So, hey, uh, oh. and, well, and I'll just add that um, I think the concept we have for the age friendly to have that demo is sort of what we're looking to do. But I think it's probably the, the one thing I would say about it is, is that you have to pick the right tech because tech changes so quickly. So you can find that you end up buying a lot of stuff that nobody ever uses anymore. Um, but I think that there are a lot, and we could probably work out something with the um, the senior centers or the library where we have one. The question I think we just kind of figure out is like where you would have it. Um, but I think that's something that we could we could investigate in doing. And um, yeah, I think I mean I. All right, um, we're wrapping up at two. And um, so I think we've got to wind things down here. And uh, um, they wanted us to do a little bit of a uh, wrap up, but I guess instead of a question at this point, is there anything, would anybody like to share anything, any nugget of information that you walked away from today that you felt that it was helpful, gave you some encouragement or some frustration. Any, any, anybody willing to share? Um, okay, but but by a show of hands, did you learn? Did you get a lot out of this today? I, I certainly did, and uh, I I I felt like our our morning session was a great broad national overview with some some serious heavy hitters nationwide. I don't think you all realize just how awesome it is to see that panel here. Um, and one of the good fortunes of living in an urban area like Washington, DC to get a panel like that. And this afternoon session with some local resources and some local ideas. And Galena, I don't know how you feel about it or how the panel members or people that have been here all day is, is that I 
personally walked away with a, a different, a little bit of a different insight, knowing a little bit more about the challenges that the, the customer is dealing with and some programs that I wasn't aware of, but this electronic health records topic and what you were talking about with the, uh, the frustration of having three doctors on three different portals. And there was a woman in the earlier session who talked about, you know, navigating her bank. Uh, like, I don't like my, my online banking. It's not easy. You know, it's, this is not an age thing. It's uh, a, a coder and a designer is designing this stuff and we just figure out how to use it. Okay. But um, I think there's, there's some really cool things that we explored uh, today. I don't know, Galena, any thoughts on your end? Absolutely. I'm, I'm really excited about all of the support that we have in the community. I think it's wonderful. I think sometimes we're, we don't know where to start. And so even one website could lead to another website, could lead to a YouTube video, could lead to a dark hole, right? Where you're, you know, you're watching horses jump around. But the internet is, a, is an amazing place uh, that, you know, you can get gain a lot of insight and information. I'm really excited about all of the local resources. And it's wonderful that all of us are here together and really have a common mission and vision and to support older adults with technology because things are coming up, right? It, AI is now a thing and we're worried about it. And so it's not so much the Chromebooks anymore for some of us, right? We have to wonder what does chat GPT, what are the possibilities of artificial intelligence? So it's, it's a whole new world, but the exciting thing is that we're, I think we're all committed to, to support the local community um, and older adults. And I think all Honestly, if, if you don't have anywhere to go, reach out to us. I feel like we're here to support you. And if it helps to kind of even get you started, uh, of course, I can, I can come to you and set up your Alexa because that's my area of exper expertise. But something like that, such a technology that's so available to consumers and it's so inexpensive could really change your life. And so I would just encourage, I think, just like our panelists, to just not, not be afraid and just take the leap, buy it, Test it out. You won't break it, and uh, you have all of the all of the support. Yeah, and then uh, several of you have asked when I've been walking around the hallways. It's sort of like, how can we get the contact info for all of the presenters? And we threw out a million websites and all that stuff. We have. Let's give a round of applause to our note takers over here. And. Uh, and our, our wonderful Zoom monitor in the back, right, right there. I mean, she's writing out these questions. I, I mean, this has probably been one of the most seamless hybrid events that I've ever been a part of. And, and the photographers, and, I mean, the videographers and those folks over here, this is awesome. And uh, yeah, so, so if you registered for this event, then you can you will get an email and I believe the Montgomery County Commission can send a link to everybody with the recording with the the contact info information we'll do the best that we can and if something's there that you wanted to have and you didn't have it just hit reply and uh, our operators will be standing by to answer your questions <laughs> and uh, and with that would somebody from the commission oh yeah Yes. Those are uh, the, the Tebs team. So thank you to Daniel, Suha, and Rishi, who's behind the scenes today. Uh, thank you very much, Steve, Galena. Our speakers today spoke about helping older adults age in place which is a significant challenge. I hope today's public forum will act as a catalyst for county leaders, caregivers, healthcare workers, and other, others working with older adults to look for ways to improve overall quality of living in their homes as we strive to make aging in place easier, safer, and secure in the place that we call home. So I'd like to thank the city of Gaithersburg uh, special thanks to our morning panel, Scott Code, all the wonderful speakers, Steve Yule, Rima Jewett, Google, there you go, uh, Ryan Elza, Neil Tintingo, uh, and to um, our wonderful 
moderator, Steve Gurney, and the afternoon panel of Mitzi Herrera, uh, Leah Bradley, Joan Green, Kathleen Williams, Monifa McKnight in video, and to Galena Ridge. Thank you from Montgomery, um, Maryland, uh, University of Maryland. Uh, thanks to all the many people who worked on and participated in the logistics of the event planning, including Charlene Simpson from the city of Gaithersburg and the Commission on Aging's Public Forum Committee and our county staff. A special thank you to our uh, planning group, Wayne Berman and Betsy Carrier, Barbara Selter, Sibo Nakubi, and Mary Sweeney, who did the heavy lifting today and, and made this a great event. Uh, and also our photographer today, Adonis Miller. Uh, wonderful to have such great photographs. We've already sent them to the public information office and uh, they're, they're getting photos as we speak. Um, and we already said our wonderful team from Tebs. So in closing, I wanna thank you, the audience, both in person and online for spending your valuable time today, listening and learning about this critical issue. Many of us, have been family caregivers, and many of us plan to be family caregivers in the near future. So we all know the challenges firsthand. We can all be change agents by putting together what we've learned today into practice and advocacy. Working together, we can do better and establish Montgomery County as a community for a lifetime. Thank you all for being here today.